Good morning, Mr. Pettis. Mr. Pettis, yes. Florida, yes. as all of us are in dismal rain. Yes, I'm sorry. You said you ready for me, Donna? We are ready for you. The floor is yours. Oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning. Uh, good morning. Um, as Donna said, as we go through this, I like and I thank you all for having your videos up because I'm I can't see you on my little computer, so I have you on my big screen TV, and I like to see faces because I look on this TV and see a blank screen. It's hard to to teach. Feel free, if you have questions, comments, feel free to interject at any point. If you don't understand something, just speak out. Let's make this interactive. Let's make it fun. Let's make it educational. So um, so having said that, I mean, how many people we have? 64, that's a pretty good number. Uh, we'll, I'm sure they'll keep coming. Um, all right, but let me just start by, well, let me just say, I'm Trent Pettis, for those who don't know. I have been um, in this business for a long time. I think I got a real estate license back in 2001. I uh, started with Alphonse with the Hicken, went on to uh, a Remax that ended up closing doing the bust, uh, managed uh, multiple offices. They had a broker's license three years, five years after I was in this business, uh, opened my own business in 2010, uh, then opened an office in Delaware, got a broker's license in Delaware, and clearly in Florida, bought a place here five years ago, uh, got a broker's license in Florida, opened an office here. And uh, it's 85 degrees today, so I'm sure um, it's nice and sunny wherever you all are. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so but let's have fun and let's learn. But I love this business. And one of the things that, one of the reasons that I, I love doing these type of workshops, because when I started this business, um, I remember dealing with agents who did not know what was in these documents. Because I used to just read every line of it because I wanted to understand this is my craft. I was going to be, I'm a real estate agent. I'm working with clients. I need to know what they are signing. I need to be able to explain these documents to them. And then I would come across agents who would say something that clearly is counter to West in the agreement of sale, for instance. And I would say, no, that's not right. And these are seasoned agents who would not know stuff that's here and it just made me more even it, it it just made me want to know even more and so every year and i would just say to you newer agents um go through these documents every year sit down you don't have to do it in one setting and, and read them you'll be amazed at um how much you'll learn and it will make you a better agent because if you know what's in this document it's easier to negotiate with someone and i'll give you an example i remember years ago um an agent said to me, um, "We didn't get the we didn't get the um, mortgage commitment in. It was due like on let's say it was due yesterday, and and I was waiting on it. And it was going to probably come today." She called and she said, "Trent, uh, we don't have this uh, mortgage commitment by noon today. Your client's going to be in default, and we're going to keep the ten thousand dollar deposit that your buyer put down." Mm -hmm. And I said to her, "I said, well, you we could. I said the seller can terminate the contract." but the seller can't keep my clients $10,000. She said, oh yes, they can. That's what the agreement of sale said. And I, I said, listen, pull out the agreement of sale. And I just pointed to the section. I said, let's, let's read this. And she said to me, someone at that point had been in business probably 30 years. And I remember she said to me, oh, I didn't know that was in there. I said, yes, you can terminate this contract, but you can't keep, you have to return the deposit money of the buyer. And that's one of the reasons I believe that you, especially if you're a newer agent, know what's in here. You, it's just gonna make you a better agent. It's gonna make you a it's just gonna make you a better agent. And if this is your craft, you really want to know the tools that you need to use in order to be better at your craft. Am I right? Can somebody just tell me yes? You agree? Yes. All right, good. At least all I need is one person to agree. Yeah. All right, let's get started then. Um, okay. The first document I like to talk about clearly, what's the first document you need to sign when you are working with anyone? The first document, when you have a substantive conversation about real estate with a consumer or customer, what document that you need to present to that, that customer or, or uh, consumer? Consumer notice. Consumer notice. When a consumer notice, and one of the things you need to remember, many times we're talking to people on the telephone. If you are talking, someone's calling you on the phone, for instance, and they ask you, hey, what's the 
square footage of that house, do you have to give a consumer notice? The answer is no. You only have to give a consumer notice when you have a substantive. Look at the consumer notice, by the way. Let's just look at that first. I didn't mean to pull it out, but you all have that. Just look at it. That very first sentence, first paragraph on the consumer notice. First of all, remind buyers, or oh, not buyers, uh, potential buyers or clients, customers, that this is not a contract. I use a highlight right. that it says it's not a yes. contract. So they should have no fear in signing something that's clearly not a contract. Because if they don't want to sign what is not a contract, you're going to have problems getting them to sign what will be a contract. All right. It says, see, in an effort to enable consumers of real estate services to make informed decisions about the business relationships they may have with real estate brokers and salespersons, the Real Estate License and Registration Act requires that consumers be provided with this notice at the initial interview. What is the initial interview? Well, the initial interview is defined as the first contact between the agent and the consumer where a substantive conversation about real estate occurs. Substantive, not the square footage of the property, not the not the, how many bedrooms, but if someone's calling and they start saying, hey, I have a pre-approval from the police and fire credit union. I have $50,000 saved. You should stop and say, let me get you a consumer notice. If you cannot get, because the consumer notice will outline all the different business relationship choices you may have with that consumer. And so if they, if you cannot get it to them by fax or by email or by text, then there is an oral consumer notice that you need to read verbatim because this buy, this consumer needs to know that information they are given to you at this point is not confidential. Because if I start saying to you, for instance, hey, I saw a listing in Manioc and my, I want to buy it and I love this area and I'm willing to pay full price for that property. You're talking, you're giving me information. You're not a client. And remember, clients uh, are protected. We owe agents, owe clients those, remember those six fiduciary responsibilities that you learned in class. Remember, I teach as an old car, obedience, loyalty, disclosure, confidentiality, accounting, and a reasonable degree of care. You don't owe all those, those uh, fiduciary responsibilities to a customer. And how do you become a client? A contract that makes you a client. So you're given information. So I'm saying, hey, that house in Van Allen, I'm going to pay full price. And I say, fine. And then you go, this same person who identifies himself as John Smith, then you get a contract the next day from an agent, from Lisa, Lisa, Lisa Risco, who sells so much. Lisa sends over a contract. And Lisa says, and I see it here, Lisa sends a client uh, of this contract that's 10000 less. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is the same buyer who called me a couple of days ago and said how much they wanted to be on this block and they would pay full price. Well, I can now take that information and share it with my seller. And then my son, we could say, because we know information that we can now use, because that was not a client, that was a customer. And I don't owe confidentiality to that person on the telephone. That's why you don't give information out, uh, this confidential information out to someone without becoming a client first. So now I say to this client, uh, the seller, why don't we, why don't we offer, why don't we count at full price? Because I know this person will pay it. We count at full price. They agree to pay it. I just, you just, because you gave me information that I was able to use against you, that's not, so just be careful when you're talking to people, and I'm probably going too far, like just, just make sure um, you get the consumer notice. Remember this, agents sometimes forget that if the transaction does not, if no transaction results uh, from this person who you give a consumer notice to, because you always have to give it to them in person once you meet them, if you do an oral consumer notice, you have to keep this for at least six months. Keep that in mind. You have to keep, you the agent should keep this consumer notice, a signed consumer notice for at least six months. If it becomes a transaction, then obviously it's going to be in a file and your broker has to keep it for a minimum of three years. So keep that in mind. Consumer notices, you the agent should keep it somewhere for six months because if, it, if the real estate commission ever asks you uh, that you give a consumer notice to this client or I mean, to this buyer or this potential buyer or this consumer, um, you should be able to show it. All right. Any questions or comments? If not, let's let's go to the grievance sale because that's what we're here for. All right. Let's look at the, the first page, buyers and sellers. One thing you should do, make sure you put down all the full name. Don't put John Smith 
if there's a John L. Smith Jr., put the full name, the middle initial, if they're junior, senior, the third, put a for the once signed by the seller, this becomes a legal document. So you want to treat it as such. Put the full names, okay? No, no nicknames, not Liz Smith when her name is Elizabeth Smith. You 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 put the full legal name. Addresses. I have never used the toll, and this is a that's just me. I don't put buyers' addresses or sellers' addresses because once years ago, I had a seller. My buyer was coming from a neighborhood that was a little rough. I was buying her first house, and the seller's agent kept asking me about her address or the neighborhood she was living in. I found it odd that he kept focusing on this neighborhood, and he kept saying there's drugs there and this and that. And I said, well, I don't know what that has to do with this offer. We made an offer above this price and we didn't get it. And I still believe it has something to do with the, the fact that he focused on this neighborhood, this address. And when I checked to see once it sold, cause I followed this because I made a note to myself to check this and see when it closes, how much they sell for. Well, it was an FHA loan. Well, I'm gonna just say it was a hundred thousand. Ours with FHA was like 105,000. So we even had a better offer than this person who they sold it to. But his focus, he talked about this address or where this woman was coming from. And from that day forward, I never put another address because I said, this man, I believe, used this address to hurt my client. My job is to do the best. I have to always act in the best interest of my client. And if I believe that someone's going to use an address to hurt them and not sell them a particular property, then I'm not going to put an address. So I'm not saying you have to do it. I don't know why a seller needs to know where my buyer lives. All right. Um, uh, uh, property address, clearly we have to put that uh, if in the municipality, if it's in Philadelphia, obviously it's Philadelphia, the zip code, the county would be Philadelphia, it's in Philadelphia. And here's one where I think agents mess up a lot in the school district. Most people go out to the, to the um, suburbs if they have children because they want to be in a particular school district. Would you all agree with that? Yeah. That they want to be in a school district. I have seen agents, and I'm sure if any, any experienced agents chime in if you want, I have seen many times in my career where the school district was wrong. So don't rely on the school district. If your buyer is going out to buy in a particular school district, you need to make sure that is correct information because, and, I, I, and I'll tell you a quick story. I was in a, a closing in Abington years ago and I just heard we had a settlement, the settlement room next to us, we hear all this promotion. So I decided I was thirsty. So I wanted to go out and get some water and because um, I want to know what was going on. And uh, and what happened was the agent, the seller's agent put that the school district, no, the elementary school was, and I always forget the name of it, uh, Copper Beach or Cooper Beach, one of them. And, but it was the other elementary school in, or I think there, I don't know if there's one or two in happened in there, but there was another elementary school that this, that this, they, they would have to attend. The, the woman who bought it had two boys and she wanted them to go to this particular elementary school because of the Blue Ribbon School. And that's why she bought this house. Well, they're in settlement and the buyer refused to sign, well, they're in settlement and the buyer, this buyer says something about, well, when I, I'm going to go register my boys at this school sometime next week. And the seller said, oh no, they don't go to this elementary school. They go to this elementary school. And she says, no, no, no. Paperwork says she doesn't sign that this is a $550,000 house. She doesn't sign the document. She gets up and she leaves the seller. And yeah. she turns around and she sues her agent. Yeah. Wow. I always say this, don't be a sloppy agent. If your seller wants to be in a particular school district or in a, in a particular school, want their children in a particular school, make sure that it's correct or better yet, Ask them to check. You can check, but I usually say, hey, I want you to check too. So we both can come up with the right answer. So it's not all on you. I like to not put the liability on me. I like to shift it because I say, hey, I want you to double check this. Make sure that school district is right. Call the district if you have, go on the website, make sure that your children will attend this elementary school. I'm going to check, but I usually ask myself, my buyer to check. I want to be certain, but just make sure if that's the only reason they're moving out there, Make sure that they go into the right school, right? Uh, Fred, the Fred, I, have a, I have a question. Um, I thank you so much for identifying this. Um, so, you know, 
when we are in a position where and many of us have been where we have to get these offers up and out and done right um right. is it in this so you're saying now that you're saying the school district thing is a thing right um and we're getting our rec you know we're we're generating our information from certain sources okay which we think are reliable sources is it better in that case to get the offer out leave that blank wait Let you were froze oh sorry can you hear me I don't know. If my, it's my computer. It's uh, hello. <clears throat> okay, I can hear you now. I can see you now. Yeah, can you hear me? No, it's his computer. It's, oh. it's got to be yours, Trent. Okay. Yeah, because he's. I'm looking at him. He's actually frozen. Actually frozen. <laughs> nice yeah. thinking. <laughs> Must be that Florida weather. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Some technical difficulties. Looks like Trent probably got off and is going to come back into the room. So let's just give him a minute there. Yeah. they don't have faith. The longer you wait, the more in debt you'll be. We'll help to create a customized plan you can afford, and you can be debt free in as little as 24 to 48 months. I am so excited to move forward with the next part of my life, and it's all thanks to my mother. If you want more than $10,000, call or visit nationaldebtrelief.com to find out how you can become debt free. Can you all hear me? Can you? I don't know what happened there. Yes, yes, yes. All right. I'm sorry. What? Can you ask a question again? Whoever that was. Yes, it is Cat Henry. Thank you, uh, Trent. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so, so, um, so I'm thinking about this. I've just had a really, really interesting and very stressful uh, transaction. Um, no. So I'm very, very, very keen on all these different parts that you're about to teach today. Um, so, um, as far as the school district stuff, we're, you know, we as realtors are gathering our information from like public records, from the MLS, blah, 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 right? So if we are under the gun or under stress to produce, to, to, to get an offer out there, you know, in a market that's getting crazy again, spring market, is it is it an option to leave it blank until it can be researched so that it is actually accurate? Absolutely. And actually, I think that's a, that's a great idea. If you're not certain, Leave it blank and ask a seller's agent to fill it in because they should know. Um, fill it in. I mean, yeah, you can do that. You can absolutely say, hey, I left the school district blank. I wasn't sure. You have something. The website shows something else. I decided to leave it blank and I'm going to ask that you complete it. So absolutely, you could do that. Absolutely. All right. Let's take a look at the buyer, the buyer relationships with the licensed brokers. Uh, if you have no relationship, that first box, no business relationship, buyer is not represented by a broker or the second one. Uh, the first box is a, the information of the buyer. The second box is information for the seller. But if you're not representing someone, then you just put up, you check that and you write nothing in a box. Rarely, you, you, that would be rare if you're not representing one represent anyone. I could think of an example if you um, you have a buyer who's buying a FISBO fence. You would be the seller box would say no business relationship because you're not you don't have a business relationship with a FISBO and then you would be representing the buyer so you would put the buyer's information. But let's just look at that. Company name clear uh Keller Williams Philly or uh, Compass or Berkshire. Uh, company license number, the address, phone number. Now, here's where sometimes people make mistakes. Buyer's agent, obviously, if you're the buyer's agent, you will check that. If it's a dual agent, you know if you're a dual agent, which means you're representing both, both the buyer and the seller in the same transaction. If you, now on the other side is a licensee, the salesperson's information. Uh, if there's more than one salesperson, sometimes you have co-agents, put the information of both the agents here, if that if there are two agents involved, don't just put one, put the information of both. Um, license number, the telephone number, email. Now, are you the buyer's agent? Now keep this in mind, especially the newer agents. If you are the buyer's agent, 
Everyone in your office also represents that buyer. That means they're getting part of the commission because they owe those same fiduciary responsibilities to that buyer. In other words, if you find out something about the buyer, you need to keep it confidential. So everybody in your office represents the same principal or client who you represent. If you are the buyer's agent of a designated agency, only you will know if your office practices designated agency. I will know that. So you would have to ask the agent, are uh, you a designated agent? Does your office practice designated agency? Again, if you don't know the answer, leave it blank and ask the agent, could you fill out whether you are, I mean, in other words, I mean, not you would know that, the seller. You don't know if the seller's agent is a designated agent or not. Um, and um, yeah, let's, let's, I think that that's it. Let's get to the, the date, the agreement sale. This is one thing, the date, I think one of the things we need to remember, we need to keep, be really mindful of dates in this contract. So when you date this, I always think it's a good practice to put the date of the date that the buyer is going to sign this. It just makes it easier. If my clients are going to come into the office tomorrow and I'm going to draw this contract up today, don't use today's date. Use the 25th. It's easier if you if you date it the same date that the buyer signs it, which is the same date that you send it to the seller. So now you know that because the dates become important when it, you try to figure out what's the execution date. Um, so it just, I just think it's better to have the date that you present it, that the buyer signs it the same date, the buyer signs it, and it's sent over to the to the to the seller. The purchase price, obviously, you know, right? I have, a question. I have yeah. a question. Sorry, a question about that. So how do we know that? Okay, so I hear what you're saying. The same date as the buyer is going to sign it. Um, if the buyer signs it the day after, because well, sometimes I hope the buyer happen. not. Well, that's fine, but I would hope yeah. the buyer. Okay, okay. I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm just saying. I, uh, yeah. I mean, it could not happen. Yeah, there's no, there's no written rule. I'm just saying for you, it's easier yeah. when you're dealing with dates to know that the date of this contract is the same date that my buyer signed it, which is the same date that I sent it to the seller. The seller may not sign it on that date. I'm just saying it makes it easier. Obviously, you could send it to a buyer today and they can sign it tomorrow. That's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. I'm just saying, just if you if if you can do it this way, do it that way, it just makes it easier on the agent. I just want things to be easier on the agent. That's all. All right, initial deposit. Here's one thing that nobody does, which I always think is a good idea. Even though it says five days, in five days, you will get a check to the five days from the execution date, you're going to submit the deposit check. Even though that says five, if it says initial deposit within blank, and if, if it's within five, if it's blank, it's five days and not specified. I believe it's always a good practice to type in that five. Why? Because now I know that you didn't, you meant to, you did you mean for it to be five, or I don't know if you overlooked that and and you really wanted to be something else, your buyer really needed more than five days. I just think it's a good idea to just type it in, even though it says five. That way I know that you saw that. My buyer knows that you saw it. I showed it to my buyer. I just think it makes it easier for you and everyone involved so that because there are times when people forget, they skip over things in a contract. This way, you know you actually view this. It's just, do you have to do it? No, but I think it's just a good practice to do it. Um, additional deposits. If there are deposits, one of the things that, um, I think we all do this in this business. Um, if you, well, I'm gonna get to that a little later. Let's get to that. Um, uh, paragraph 2D says that when you submit a, an agreement, if you wanna close within 30 days and you need that, you cannot submit a personal check. You could, the seller could take a personal check, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but it has to be by wire funds or cashier's check. Now, I recently had an agent who said, I said, we're going to wire the money. The agent said, no, the seller, uh, my broker doesn't want wire funds. Well, the contract says that the buyer can submit. Will uh, It says all funds paid by the buyer within 30 days, including funds paid as settlement, will be by cashier's check or wire funds, but not by personal check. So if you don't want to accept wired funds, make sure you designate that in the contract because it says that the buyer can submit this uh, uh, deposit by wired funds. You can't decide no wired funds because the contract says it. So if you don't want, if your office doesn't want wired funds, they put in a contract 
we will only accept certified checks, for instance, and not wired funds. Um, C, um, deposits usually are held by the broker for the seller. We know that. More and more, I'm seeing that title companies are holding them. In Florida, brokers do not hold any. The one thing when I opened an office in Florida, the first thing a broker told me was, shut down your escrow account. I said, what do you mean? He said, because don't ever hold escrow in Florida. Let the title company hold it. Title companies hold escrows here. Buyers send their, their deposits to the escrow. They wire the money. Everything is wired. Nobody sends, use check, uses checks in Florida. Nobody uses checks. Everything's wired to the title company. Uh, so you, um, it says deposits, regardless of the form, will be, uh, they're going to be paid in U.S. dollars to the broker for the seller who normally holds it. But uh, unless otherwise stated here, if someone else is going to hold it, like the title company or an attorney, you need to name, put the name of the title company. Don't just say title company. Say uh, ABC title or the attorney with, with the law firm because we should know where who's holding that money because if there's a dispute, I don't need, you can't just say attorney for a seller or I mean attorney for a buyer, I need to know who this attorney is. Now keep this in mind. The rule, well, let's look at it. It says deposits, I'll go down and says with uh deposits are being held by broker and seller. And it says that only real estate brokers, look at that sentence, only real estate brokers are required to hold deposits in accordance with the rules and regulations of the state real estate commission. Only brokers that not attorneys, not title companies, only brokers, which means that you brokers can only give that money back under four circumstances. We don't know what the title company's uh, guidelines are about returning escrow funds or the attorney, because there's going to be an escrow agreement. And maybe it says that the title company gets to determine who gets this escrow money in the event of a dispute. So i don't particularly want attorneys or title companies holding escrow because of a broker is holding the escrow. I know that broker has to, well, let's take a look at it. Go, go to paragraph 20, I think it's 26. Let me just show you that real fast. We'll get to look at paragraph 26 and we'll get to it in a minute. On the default, take a look at, it says um, 26B, regardless of who the apparent entitlement to deposit monies, Pennsylvania law does not allow a broker holding deposit monies to determine who is entitled to deposit monies when settlement does not occur. Broker can only release the money and make sure you tell your buyers, because buyers don't understand this, that if there is a dispute, you can't just go to the broker and say, give me my money back. The broker is not under, it, under law, under Pennsylvania law, that broker cannot just hand a check to you unless one of these four things is, uh, is present. Look at the first one. If the agreement is terminated prior to settlement and there is no dispute over entitlement to deposit money, then that broker can release the money to you. There's no dispute. And this further says that uh, uh, a signed agreement shows there's no dispute. Get that release of an agreement sale that says buyer and seller releasing the money back to the buyer. There is no dispute. The agent broker can say, Mr. Buyer, Ms. Buyer, here's your deposit back. So there's no dispute. Broker can release the money. The second one, there is a dispute, but it's been resolved. Look at number two, it says, if after the brokers receive deposit monies, broker receives a written agreement that is signed by the buyer and the seller directing the broker how to distribute some or all the deposit <clears throat> money. Well, there was a dispute, but the buyer and the seller uh, settled the dispute. Maybe they're going to split it. Maybe it's all going to the seller, all going to the buyer, but they, they give an agreement, a release saying, hey, release the money to, this is how you release the money, Mr. or Mrs. Broker. And there's it. I can do it as a broker. Number three, there is a there is a uh, there was a dispute, but it was a settled by a court. Take a look at number three. According to the terms of a final uh, order of court, well, you went to court. Judge says buyer's entitled to the escrow money or seller's entitled, but make sure it's a final judge, a final uh, order. It's not there are no further appeals. It's a final order of the court. And the fourth one we'll talk about later. Uh, if, if there is a prior written agreement. Well, the next paragraph in this agreement of sale uh, is a, you can write over it, is a prior written agreement, which we'll talk about later. So, so buyer and sell. So we'll talk about that <laughs> later, but that's, if there's a prior written agreement with, and there is one, that's paragraph six, I'm paragraph C. All right.
So, so a broker can't just decide who gets the artist's money deposit. He or she has to distribute that money according to one of, the, one of these four things must be present. All right. And buyers should be aware of that, of that because sometimes disputes happen and buyers will walk into, I'll have a buyer walk in, we represent the seller and says, hey, uh, clearly the seller's in the fall. I'm here to pick up my money. I said, well, I can't write you a check without, you know, I mean, there's a dispute, even though I know you may be right, but I can't determine who is entitled to the deposit. I, I, it's out of my hands at that point. Uh, um, I, sorry, sorry, again, it's me. Um, so everything that you're talking about, I've actually experienced. So um, my brokers does not hold deposit monies. Okay. Uh, my tight one of the title companies that I used does not did hold the title, and now they no longer do because right. of this issue. So, how do we talk to our buyers about deposit money or sellers about deposit money if the broker is not holding it and the title comp? Well, let's say the title company is holding it. In this case, the broker is not holding it. So, I know you're saying you recommend that the broker holds it right. because of this paragraph and because of how it's written, but. How about if that's not the case? Well, you can decide if you want someone else to hold it, it says right there who you just have to type who's holding. If your if your company's not holding escrow, let the let the broker for the buyer hold it. Buyer hold it, yep. Yeah. Yep. Just give it to the buyer's agent. Trent, can I add something? Yes, sir. And 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 first, I'm a big advocate of this. Like, do not go to the title company, do not do not come with attorney unless they have a, a what do you call it? A, a an escrow agreement, right? right. That's one thing, right? But nowhere in our agreement of sale and nowhere in the deposit money notice does it say it goes to a title company, okay? Because okay. the very first line of deposit money notice states the listing broker is required to hold deposit money. Right. So I don't know why they started this stuff, but I, I don't like it. So you can tell I don't like it. Well, I, I agree. I don't like it either. But, but let me say this. As far as deposit money notice, you're right. But the only reason that the Pennsylvania, the real estate settlement procedure, no, not real estate, the real estate license and registration act requires anytime a buyer turns over escrow funds to a buyer, the buyer's agent, and that buyer's agent intends to turn it over to someone else, namely the broker for the seller, then by law, they have to let this buyer know who's going to be holding this, their money. That's the purpose of this uh, deposit money because it's saying the listing broker is a Pennsylvania licensed real estate broker is required to hold your sales. You have sales deposit and escrow, selling brokers accepting your deposit on behalf of and for transfer. So I'm taking your money, but I'm saying to this, aid, this buyer, hey, I'm accepting your money, but I'm transferring it to this other office. So the buyer knows where his or her escrow money is being held. Just like in our lease agreements, you have to say where that security deposit is being held. If I give you a security deposit, you need to tell me it's being held at TDP, I mean, at, at, at PNC Bank. I need to know where you're holding my money. Right. But yeah, but I agree with you. I, 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 mean, I think right. I'm not a fan of it. agents are having people sign that and sending the money to a, to a title company. That I don't know that I believe they're wrong because they're I agree wrong. with you there, Vets, and that 100%. if they're signing right. this, it should not be going to a title company. It should be going to right. a broker. My but title company but, won't hold it. My client company will not hold it. Trent, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I mean, throughout the six years I've been wholesaling, I never hold on to a check. Why? Why? Why should brokers hold on to uh, a check? Uh, why should? Why shouldn't a third party hold on to the check? Why shouldn't they? Or why? Should yeah, they? I mean, tech, why? No, we should. I, I personally think title company should hold the EMD. All right, but this, I don't want to get into this debate. Is you can have anybody you want hold it. The title company is legally allowed to hold to escrow, so is an attorney. I personally don't think it's a good idea for the reason I stated. I'm going to say this one more time, that the title company and the attorney are not held to the same right. guidelines or laws and regulations as a, as a licensed broker. A broker, okay, I just gave you, there are four situations where a broker can release that money. You can have an escrow agreement from the title company that says we get to determine who gets the money. Yeah. I don't know what that escrow agreement says. All of them are different. The attorney may say after 10 days, if something hadn't happened, we turn the money back over to the buyer or we give the money to the seller. You need to know what's in those escrow agreements because you, you have a client whose money may be turned over to someone else and 
you know, maybe they shouldn't have that money. If if I'm dealing with a broker, I know that broker can't decide that you get this escrow money when you're not entitled to it. I know they can't do that. I don't know what a title company can do. I don't know what a lawyer can do, but I know what a licensed broker can do. So I would rather have it in the hands of a broker than an attorney. All right. But let me move on. I would like to just Let's move on, y'all, because I don't want to talk too much about that. Let's move on because we got so much to cover. Let's look at the seller assist. Um, seller assist, please, if you are an agent, and, and I'm sure anybody who's been in business a long time has seen this. Look at this sentence that says a seller is limited, is only obligated to pay up to the amount or percentage which is approved by the mortgage lender. If you are the buyer's agent, please make sure you know the maximum amount of seller assist that 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 buyer can get. Seller assist is money that the seller can help um, the buyer. I mean, help pay the buyer's closing costs. FHA, you we all know is six percent. If you have an FHA loan, you don't have to ask a lender. The seller can give up the six percent seller assist. If it is a if it's a uh, VA loan, we know it's four percent, but the seller can also pay some of the other fees. If it's a conventional loan, it depends on the down payment. It could go from two percent to four percent. I've even seen six percent. It depends with conventional. So you need to make sure if you represent the buyer, what is a maximum amount of seller assist? So now here's the issue. You put 6% seller assist with the conventional loan, seller accepts that offer. And then you learn that the maximum seller assist, and I'm sure if you've been in this business while, well, you've seen this many times. Seller, my agent calls me and says, hey, Trent, we can only get 3%. We'd like you to reduce the price. Or we'd like you to do give us a new roof. Or do, and, and I said, we're not doing anything. Because this parent, this says that the seller is only obligated to pay up to the amount or percentage which is approved by the mortgage lender. Well, the mortgage lender says your client can only get 3%. That's not the seller's fault. That is your issue. You should have checked first to make, before you submitted a contract, you should have made sure you knew the maximum amount of seller assist that your client can receive. Don't come back and try to renegotiate the contract. That is it. The maximum now in the example I just gave is 3%. So your client can only get three. So I caution you here, make sure if it's a conventional loan, you know the maximum seller assist your client is allowed. But do you all agree with me? You experienced agents, have you seen that? Yes. 100%. All the time. All the time. I see it yes. all the time. Okay, yes. all the time. And I thank you because it is commonplace. Matter of fact, it was, I would say every fourth agreement I get, I, I have this issue where I'm like, are you sure your client can get, this lender's going to give you 6% on this conventional loan? Oh yeah, they told me. I said, well, do you show me something in writing before I take this to my seller? Because I already know there's not. Or oh, I'll call the, the loan office. They say, oh, they can get 4%. And I'm like, all right. All right. Oh, uh, so a quick question before you move on. Yes. Um, could, I heard you say, what, VA was 4%? Yeah, but there's also, but there's, there, you can also, but with VA, I think the seller can even pay some of the other fee buyers closing costs, but it's 4%, but I think it's really higher than four because there's some other things they can pay, but I'm not, I'm not exactly what those things are. Okay. okay. But yeah, just yeah. know that, but to ask, but ask your lender, just the only time you don't need to ask a lender is if it's FHA, but we all know it's 6%. We all know yeah, it's 6%. Yeah. VA is four, but there are some other things that I think is, that the seller can pay on the buyer's fees that the seller can pay. All right, the settlement and, and possession, settlement date. Another thing I see mistakes, don't have a calendar in front of you when you put this here. I've had contracts that said December 25th. I said, that's Christmas day, <laughs> um, 4th of July. Um, I'm thinking, don't you, who's working on the 4th of July? What bank is open? What title company? Please look at a calendar before you put a date. I've seen a Sunday, a Saturday. I'm like, what calendar are you using? Don't just put a date. Put Make sure that date is not on a holiday or weekend. Just, just and, and believe it or not, I mean, I've seen it many times where I look at the calendar. I said, wait a minute, that's a Saturday. So just, you're not closing on a weekend. You're not closing on a, on a holiday. Um, now, um, now we go down to payment of transfer taxes on G, 4G. Who pays the transfer taxes? 
contract says it's split equally between the buyer and the seller. Again, everything in a contract is negotiable. So you can make the buyer can pay it all, seller can pay it all. When you're dealing with uh, bank-owned properties, usually the buyer will pay it all. Because bank-owned properties, REO is going to say, we ain't paying no transfer taxes. Um, the transfer tax in Philadelphia is 4.278% of that 4.278% is split between the buyer and the seller. So the buyer pays 2.14%, seller pays 2.14%. And of that 4.278%, 3.278% goes to the city of Philadelphia. 1% will go to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. If you go out to the suburbs, the total transfer tax is 2%. Delaware County, Montgomery County, uh, Chester County, all the surrounding counties, the total is 2%. Philadelphia is 4.278%. And that's not even the highest in the state. Pittsburgh is higher. I think Redding is higher. Um, somewhere else. I mean, I think they have 5% or even higher than 5 So Philadelphia is not even the highest. Okay, we're um, number 10. What was that? We're number 10. We're number 10. Yeah, so there's nine higher than us when people okay. go four point two eight. Who's, a, who's the highest, Lisa? Is Pittsburgh or Scranton uh, I, one of the highest? I right? can't remember. I have the list somewhere. I might yeah, find it before you finish. I think somebody's, I know they're over 5%. So mm -hmm. Philadelphia, it's, people complain. That's still a lot, but it's not the highest. Gee, this is important here. I always get, when I'm selling properties, why well, I have a seller, and and let's say if it's a uh, like a shell or, or you know an estate property, you'll get a contract that says a seller must remove all personal items. You never have to put that addendum. You never have to add that because look at G. It says possession is to be delivered by deed, existing keys, and physical possession to a vacant property free of debris with all structures broom clean. So you don't have to say that the seller needs to remove all his or her personal items because every property must be uh, received with, uh, should be broom swept clean. You, that means you can't leave your old sofa in the basement. Um, that does not mean you can put that old sofa in the garage, I mean, in the backyard. Please keep that in mind. If you have a seller broom swept clean, the premises, the, the part of the real estate it's a backyard, the side yard. You can't take all your junk from the basement and put it on the side of the house or put it out today for trash and trash is not until Tuesday. You need to make sure all of the personal, all the personal items are removed from the premises, not thrown in the backyard. And I've seen that where I come, the room, the house is fine, but they put all this junk in the backyard for the buyer to clean. That is not okay. Make sure it is, it is clean. That includes all the real, all the property, not just the house, the backyard, front yard, side yard. Um, if you are aged, if you are buying a property with an existing tenant, um, one of the things I believe you should do, one of the things I would do, I do, when I get leases, I give a copy of a lease to us, the new buyer, ask that buyer to initiate, I mean, to initial and date every page because I want to make sure that buyer has received it and they've initialed every page and they're going to sign the back of it. I want to make sure that no one can come back and say, I never saw this lease. And one thing that I, I think um, we should do, what some agents probably do, uh, some of us don't, um, when you're buying a, when you sell it, when you're buying a property with a tenant, make sure you get a rent roll. Because if I'm buying, my client is buying an investment property, let's say it's a triplex, and I want to know whether or not these people pay the rent and they pay on time. Are they in foreclosure? I mean, are they in, uh, they're about to be evicted. And if you're in Philadelphia, eviction could take, it could take a long, long time. So I want the buyer. I don't want an agent giving me an addendum saying that, I mean, we know there's a tenant occupied addendum we can use. You should use that. But I want rent rolls. I want to know is tenant in, in first floor in the last 12 months, has this tenant paid on time? Oh, give me a, tell me when they paid their rent every month for the last six months or last 12 months. Give me that. And I want the, I want the buyer, I mean, the seller, the landlord, the seller to, to sign this because I don't want the agent to tell me that the, that the person on the first floor paid every month on time. And then we learned that the person on the front, first floor has been evicted. And now, uh, we go back to that previous owner and the owner says, I never told the agent that I, I told the agent that buyer was in, I mean, the person on first floor was in fourth and then about to be evicted. I want a, I want the seller's signature on something that says, this is how these people pay their rent. And most of us don't do that. 
I want a rent roll. I'm not taking your word that they pay every month on time. I've been in this business too long and found, and I'm sure some of these others, some of you listen to me will agree that people don't always say the truth about tenants. Sometimes landlord or sellers will sell because they don't want to deal with these tenants any longer because they may not be paying. Um, time is of the essence, paragraph five. Time is of the essence, what does it mean? It just means that you need to adhere to all the dates and times in this contract. They are they are basically etched in stone unless you both agree to change them, both parties. So you can't decide, well, the settlements at 20 is on Monday, but you know what? I'm going away this weekend, so we're going to change it Tuesday. No, you can't just do that unless the seller agrees. But time is of the essence means that you must adhere. That's why you need to know these dates as the agent, because you have to adhere to all the dates and times in this contract. All right. Look at the um, set B says the settlement date and all, not some, all other dates and times identified for the performance of any obligations of this agreement are of the essence and are binding. OK, you cannot change anything. You decide you need more time to do a home inspection. Well, you should have put that. All right. Don't just rush to do this. Put some thought behind it. All right. Um, any questions or comments? Execution date. Make sure you understand that the execution date is the date after the last party signed it, usually the seller. So the execution date, if today the buyer signed the contract yesterday, signed the offer, made the offer yesterday, signed this um, agreement yesterday, we sent it to the seller, the seller signs it today, the 24th of March, then the execution date is March 24th. You count the day after the execution date. So if you say there are 10 days to do a home inspection, you don't count the 24th. You would count starting the 25th and execute. And those dates, they they count their calendar dates. They, they count. You have to count weekends, holidays. OK, so if you say 10 days to do a home inspection, don't start on the 27th. You start the 25th. You, day, you count you just count the day after the date of execution. The date of execution is the date the last party signed this contract and made it a contract, all right? So it says the execution date, look at 5C. This is for the purposes of this agreement, the number of days will be counted from the execution date, excluding the date this agreement was executed. So if the day was executed, the, the agreement was executed, we don't count today. So. Uh, the, for the purpose of this agreement, the number of days will be counted from the execution date, excluding the date this agreement was executed today, and including the last day of the time period. And it says all changes to this agreement shall be initial and dated. Don't ever make any changes without having initial and important, and more importantly, having it dated. Because if you make changes, you could change the execution date. Make sure anytime you make a change, you initial and date, because now you may have a new execution date, you don't want a seller saying, hey, you didn't do that home inspection. Today was your last day. And you said, no, it's tomorrow because remember, I signed it on this day. No, that's, that's why you, when you initial something, make sure you always date it. Date it. Don't ever initial anything without dating it. All right. Any question? Zoning. No question. Zoning. Uh, if you are selling a residential property only, you don't have to put the zoning classification in this contract. I think that's unwise. I don't care what the zoning classification is. I believe you should put it here. Again, when I see blanks, I don't know if you forgot to fill it in or you meant to leave it blank. I think it's a good practice for agents to fill it in, even if it's residential, if it's RS5A. You don't have to put it, but just put it there. You're not, nothing's hurt, you know, that the, put, it, put it there. But if it's anything other than residential, you have to put the zoning classification. Take a look at paragraph six. It says, failure of this agreement to contain the zoning classification, except in cases where the property is zoned solely or primarily to permit, permit single family dwellings will render this agreement boardable at the buyer's option. So if you fail to put the zoning classification, if it's anything other than residential, then the buyer could void this contract. So it's just better to put the zone and classification no matter what it is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does yes. that make sense? Yes. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, number seven. Uh, oh, and look at look at zoning classification. It says the zoning classification as set forth in a local zoning ordinance. That's where you get the zoning classification ordinance. You cannot go to any site to get it. How does a city? What does a city say is zoned as? All right, and Pennsylvania. And sometimes you have issues in Philadelphia, but just make sure if it's anything other than residential, just if you have to double check, check. Um, and if you want to make zoning, uh, let's say you have a client who says, hey, I want to I want to open a pizzeria here is already daycare. Am I able to make it would zoning permit me to open a pizzeria and not a daycare? Well, then there is a zoning. I think that's included as a zoning up. Uh, what is it called? The zoning uh, 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 contest, zoning contingency. Somebody tell me what it's called. Zoning. It's called the zoning approval contingency addendum. Use oh, yeah. that. The zoning approval contingency addendum, which will allow you to verify that the present use is allowable. Or if you want to change the, if the buyer wants to change the zoning, uh, you would use that form and the, the seller saying, I'll give you a certain number of days at your expense to see if you if if the city will allow you to change the zoning from one use to another. But if you look at paragraph 12, if you want to, if you if you're trying to verify the present zoning or you want to change the zoning to something else, or to then make sure you elect on pay um, under paragraph 12. You see uh, deeds restrictions and zoning elect that all right because it says buyer may in, in investigate easements deed and use restrictions that apply to the property and review local zoning ordinances buyer may verify that the present use of the property uh, is permitted and may elect to make the agreement contingent upon an anticipated use so make sure if you want to make zoning a um, contingent you want to make uh, you want to make this contract contingent on the present uh, verifying the present use or or being able to change the zone and make sure you elect that um, make sure you elect that all so right the trend where it says present so if you elect that because I just had a contract like this if you elect that then do you have to state the present use in that blank or is the fact that you should you, you should, you you should put the present use right whatever the present use is because the okay. seller saying the present use is blank whatever it is now. Because you right, and then were they going to verify the present use? Because sometimes people are using properties for in a way that they're not permitted to use. We all know that. All right, um, zone uh, fixtures and personal properties. Um, personal property. I think he. Well, let's take a look at it. Make sure you have sellers understand that they can't go take a certain things out of the property. It says including the sale, unless you, of course, you can. There's a uh, D says excluded. If you want to exclude anything, then then write it in D. Excluded fixtures and items, but included. Look at seven B. Included in this sale are all existing items permanently installed in or on the property, including. I mean, free of liens and other items, including plumbing, blah blah blah. The radiator covers. One I go into a lot of houses. Radio radiator 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 covers. The seller decided that she wants to take those with her. Well, you can't. Uh, lighting fixtures, including chandeliers and ceiling fans. That we all know is a big one. Uh, I've been in many houses where the seller decided to take the antique chandelier down and replace it with something that they got at the dollar store. Well, when the buyer came in to look at this property, they saw that antique chandelier in the living room. And that's one of the things they loved about the house. Well, you can't decide to go down to the Wawa and get a chandelier. You need to leave that chandelier. And I remember once it was a house in Haverford. I sold the house and the seller wrote in, she wrote in MLS that the seller will remove the chandelier and replace it with a comparable chandelier. Now my seller was going to renovate it. So he didn't want the chandelier. We come in to do our pre seller walk through the morning settlement and there's an ugly chandelier hanging there. He said, what is this? I said something they picked up at the dollar store over the weekend and hung it. And now, and I said to the agent, I said, you said that you replaced that beautiful antique chandelier with a comparable chandelier. Well, it's comparable to me means another sh antique chandelier, not something you got at the Wawa. And so that would have been an issue. That could have been an issue, but the buyer didn't care. 
What do I recommend? If you're going to remove, first of all, if you're going to remove a chandelier, I tell sellers, can you remove it before we show? It? That's number one. If you can do that, remove it and put up what you want, and that's not an issue. Some sellers will say, no, I want, I want to be to look at my chandelier. I want to use my chandelier until we sell it. Well, what I would recommend, if you're going to remove it, say exactly, put an MLS or do an addendum, put exactly what you're going to replace it with. This chandelier is going to replace with this chandelier, this model, this color, this size, and I'm purchasing at Home Depot. Now, when the buyer comes in on pre sale walkthrough, they should expect to see exactly what was in that addendum. There's no surprise now. They can't say, I don't like it. Well, you agree to it because you, we, 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 we uh, created an addendum and we said, this is exactly what we're going to replace that uh, chandelier with. So when you walk in, that's what's there. Make sense? Yes. All right. So go back to the items included. So chandelier pools, spas, hot tubs, leave all that stuff there, electric fencing system, garage door openers and transmitters. I don't know how many times, I don't know if people eat garage door openers, but I don't know if I've ever seen a garage door opener when I sold a house with a garage door opener. Somehow they just seem to Walk away. Mounting, look at this, mounting brackets and hardware for television and sound equipment. You shouldn't move that. You should, I mean, that's per, that's considered real property. You can take the TV, but clearly I don't want the mounting system. So negotiate this up front. You know, say, yeah, I want the buy, seller to remove the TV, all the brackets, and, and patch up the holes and paint. It's better to do this on the front end. I don't want to, I think settlement's supposed to be a celebration, not a fight. I don't want to go to a settlement and have to argue about holes in the wall or this, this bracket on the, in my living room. Where I don't want a TV in my living room. Negotiate everything on the front end and you will have fun on the back end. All right. Um, shades and uh, storage sheds. You can't take the storage shed. That's real estate. Fences, mailboxes, shades and blinds, awnings, a range, obviously. Unless stated otherwise, the following items included in the sale. Uh, okay, and if you want to exclude something, you want to exclude that chandelier, write it there, but also say exactly what you're going to replace it with so you don't have any issues. Any questions? Buyer financing. Uh, regardless of any contingency elected in this agreement, if buyer chooses to obtain mortgage financing, the following will apply. Buyer will be in the fall if the buyer, if, if the, uh, if the buyer furnishes false information. You should always tell buyers that you and sellers, you need to be completely in it. I mean, honest with the the information you want, you are that you are uh, given to the all parties, the lender, the the seller. Don't don't um, don't uh, decide to fudge it. So don't make it sound better. Just give them the truth because they could come back. Because if you get denied from the loan from some information you provide to the lender that was false then you may end up losing your earnest money deposit. All right. Um, the, with that, here's uh, look at number two, within blank days, again, if you're going to leave it at seven, type in seven. Within seven days from the execution date of this agreement, make sure buyers understand that buyer will make a completed mortgage application. You have to do your mortgage application within, 30, within seven days if it's seven. If it's five, it's 10, whatever, buyers can't just decide. Again, remember we're talking about time is of the essence. You must adhere to all the all the dates and terms in this contract in order to avoid possibly being in default, all right? Um, three, seller will provide access to insurers, representatives, representatives and may be required by mortgage lenders as may, be, as may be required by mortgage lenders to survey and blah, 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 praise inspectors. In other words, sellers need to make, make sure when anyone, inspectors, appraisers, anyone comes to that property, utilities are on. If you're selling a property with the utilities are off, when you looked, when you showed it, before you do a home inspection, I personally will go to the property and check myself. I've had agents say, yes, Trent, all the lights, all the utilities are on, and the day of uh, the day of the home inspection, the water's not on. Or they or the or the gas not on. Oh no, they told me Trent was on. I usually just go over and check. If the house is vacant, I sell that agent this. I'm gonna go over uh two days before because you told me they're on just to double check. That way I can come back to the agent and say, hey, the lights still weren't on. Or we can cancel the home inspection because you don't want an inspection inspector showing up. 
and they can't do the inspection and will still charge a fee, you don't want to have that issue. Um, the FHA, that box on the bottom, uh, if you're dealing with an FU, if your client has an FHA or VA loan, that box says that the FHA or VA loan, if you get an FHA or VA loan, then the property must appraise for the purchase price or higher. The purchase price or higher. If it appraises for less than the purchase price, then that buyer can walk away from that uh, contract. They can void the contract. So if I'm selling a, um, I'm buying a $300,000 house with an FHA loan, uh, so if you if you you just need you see the box you just put the purchase price there whatever the purchase price not the loan amount the purchase price all right because it says in there the purchase price is stated in the agreement so if I'm buying a three hundred thousand dollar property get an FHA insured mortgage loan then uh, if the property appraises at two ninety five what first thing I would ask is the seller to reduce the price to from three hundred thousand two ninety five but the seller says no. The other option is a buyer can make up the difference. They can pay that difference. If the buyer can't do that, the buyer can choose to walk away from that transaction. Any questions, any comments? Oh, let me finish that box. Look at the next box. Make sure you check that for your protection. If it's an FHA or VA loan, they have, the buyer has received the HUD notice for your protection, get a home inspection. Make sure the buyer has received that and signed that because one of the, the HUD rules requires lenders to provide this notice to buyers before signing an agreement sale. So that for your protection, get a home inspection, make sure that buyer, if it's an FHA or VA loan, this, this is a HUD rule that requires that buyers receive this before they sign an agreement sale. Mortgage contingency. If you waive the mortgage contingency, does that mean you're paying cash? Because that's what I hear all the time. If I, more, if I waive the mortgage contingency, does that mean this buyer is paying cash? Anyone? No. 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 It's just a lot not of agents, right. It's lot just of not agents think, kind of mortgage. <laughs> right. A lot of agents think they have to say to their clients, it's a cash transaction. Mm -hmm. Just because they waive the mortgage contingency, they can still get a mortgage loan. The contract is not contingent upon them qualifying or getting approved for a mortgage loan. They can still get one, but if they don't get approved, then that's not, then they would, they would just forfeit. They would breach a contract because they, if they can't buy it, um, but if you, but because you waive a mortgage contingency, look at it, this says this sale is not contingent. Why do people waive mortgage contingencies? Because it makes a stronger offer. If you're in a seller's market, like we've had for years, a strong seller's market, you know you can qualify. You know you got enough money in the bank to cover it. So you can show I can buy the house cash. Why not waive the mortgage contingency? You know you got a pre-approval. You you got great credit. I waive it because if I've got two offers and one's a pre has a pre uh, has a mortgage contingency and one does not and everything else is equal, I'm choosing the one with no mortgage contingency. That means there's no appraisal involved. That means if this person doesn't buy this property, then they will lose their earnest money deposit. Um, but if I have a mortgage contingency, the mortgage company can ask for repairs. Buyer can say, walk away. Uh, the appraiser may come in too low. Buyer can walk away. But I, I'm, I don't have any of these issues if the mortgage contingency is waived. So waive the, the sale. If you waive, again, the mortgage contingency, the sale is not contingent on mortgage finance, and although the buyer may obtain mortgage financing. And it says the buyer and the seller understand that the waiver of this contingency does not restrict the buyer's right to obtain mortgage financing for the property. Um, so even, the, and the seller cannot say, oh, because this mortgage contingency was waived, I'm not going to let any appraiser in my house. Well, the seller can't do that. The seller still has to uh, uh, cooperate with anybody who wants to come in uh, that's, that's connected to this buyer getting financing. Just because they waived it, it doesn't mean they still can't get it. It's just not contingent on. Now, if the mortgage lender comes back and says, we want these repairs before we give you a loan, the seller obviously is not obligated to make any repairs. They can say, buyer, you want to make them. But if the buyer walks away, then the buyer could be in default. Excuse and me. And if you, yes. If it's cash, 
he can still have an appraisal contingency in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you should put that. Yes. And if it's cash, you should say it's cash. I would put it under additional terms or something. This is a cash deal. Don't say, don't just waive the mortgage contingency and think it because I don't know it's cash. I'm assuming, I assume most people waive mortgage contingencies are still getting loans. I would say probably 75% of the deals I've seen that waive the mortgage contingencies when we get the settlement, there's a loan officer sitting there. So if it's cash, say cash, because that still makes a difference. If I'm a listing agent and I know this is a cash transaction, it's different than if I know is you waive the mortgage contingency and you get a hard money loan. I mean, that's the difference for me. I'm again, if everything's equal, I'm taking the cash transaction over the mortgage contingency that's waived, but I know they're getting a loan. So if it's cash, I would say cash. And if you want to use a appraisal contingency, absolutely, you should do that. Um, and if you elect the wet mortgage contingency, the sale is contingent upon buyer obtaining mortgage financing according to the terms outlined below. And you see that other blank that says, but in any, uh, well, let's finish. This sale is contingent upon buyer obtaining mortgage financing according to the terms outlined. And it says, upon receiving documentation demonstrating that the lender has basically approved this loan, uh, then the buyer will promptly deliver a copy of the documentation to the seller, but in any case, no later than blank. That is your mortgage commitment date. Mortgage con commitment date should probably be around 10 days. I wouldn't do less than 10 days before closing because if there's any issues that show up in the condition in the mortgage commitment that need to be resolved by the buyer, you want to have time to do it. So I would probably say, but you don't want a 30 day, no, just maybe 10 days, 12 days before settlement, you want the mortgage commitment. You should be, you so, um, I would probably put 10, 12 days. Um, so on the first, in the first, so in the first block, I mean, this block with the first mortgage, you put in, you put in the information, you, well, you put in the loan amount, the, the terms, if it's 30 years, the type of mortgage is conventional, FHA, uh, the LTV, if it's conventional mortgage lender, um, and the interest rate that you're willing to take up to a maximum from, let's say, from 6% to 6.2. If, if you can't qualify for a loan higher, uh, lower than 6.2, obviously the buyer doesn't have to go forward with the deal, can get his or her earnest money deposit back. And that last box is uh, points. Uh, uh, how many points is this buyer willing to accept from this lender? A point is equal to 1% of the loan amount. So some, if the lender is charging four points and it's Sellers only will, I mean, the buyers only will pay two, then obviously the buyer does not have to take that loan. One of the things that you want to do, be careful here, if the buyer changes the terms in this box, you need permission from the seller's agent or from the seller. If you put TD Bank is where this loan, and you get this, this buyer is getting a conventional loan from TD Bank, and you decide to go get a FHA loan from, from, um, from Truist, then you need to have that use that change in terms because if the seller accepted this offer because they knew you were getting a loan from TD, a conventional loan from TD Bank, and now they know that you're going to get an FHA loan from a different bank, the seller needs to agree to that because you're supposed to get a loan from TD Bank. Now, could you go and get approved from TD Bank and get this loan and decide you want a, a bank from another, a conventional loan from another bank that have better terms? No seller's going to say no, but get an addendum. Sign something where the seller can't come back and say, wait a minute, you breached this contract because you got a loan from this company as opposed to that company. Nobody's going to say no, but always protect yourself. Get an addendum sign. All right. Trent, yes. can I ask you a question? Sorry, sure. Pat, one second. In that in that box, if somebody's on the fence of what, what what can we do to not box them into just one lender at that point? So they have a pre pre approval from TD, but they're still on the fence. They have seven days to decide. What's the that, best? That, that, that maybe in the additional under and that additional terms, I would write that the the seller. I mean, the buyer, seller, uh, seller agrees, allow the buyer to continue to, you know, uh, look at other banks. I mean, just write something that, for just just say that, I'm not telling you what to say, just, just make it, just let, alert the seller that the buyer may change lenders, that this is the loan that this buyer has a pre-approval from, but 
this buyer is also looking at other banks and within five days, the buyer will alert the seller as to which lender he or she will use. I mean, I, just put I something. Also, oh, I'm sorry. Right, I, I've, I've seen, and I'm sure you have, buyer's choice to be determined. Right. I've seen that too. Yes, I have. And that's okay. And I thank you for that. That's something else you're going to do. Buyer's choice. Now, I would accept that as a seller's agent because I want to know, you know, I don't want you just, I want to have an idea where you're going to get a loan because there's some banks I don't personally like. I, I want to make sure I, well, sure. You're, but you're also providing, but you're also providing, uh, at least I provide, you know, when, when you're, when you're putting together the offer, you're putting together, you got the pre-approval certificate, you got that, which is showing the lender on there. Right. But, but as they say, you, if you still decide it, you, you, I've seen buyers choose buyers choice or put that they're still choosing determined. and they will, they will let the buyer know. Yes, Sue, what did you say? I was going to say to be determined or buyer's choice. Oh, to be, yeah, that's another one. Put to be, to be determined. I've seen that one too. I, I, don't, just, I don't accept them. I see. I wouldn't accept that either. Oh, uh, part of the yeah, I don't accept them either. See, I would accept that, but you could put that. I would never take it to be determined. I personally would send it back and say, you need to determine it before the seller accepts it. I want to know what bank you use it. Because if you tell me a certain bank, I'm going to say, I'm going to tell my seller, listen, I'm familiar with this bank and they never close on time and you're moving to California. We need, so I have an obligation to let my seller know what I know about a lender. If I have a certain lender, we all work with lenders who can't close a door, let alone a deal. And so <laughs> I'm not, not going to let my seller accept this offer uh, knowing that they're going to use a particular bank and I'm not naming uh, the banks. So yeah. question. <laughs> Question. Yes. Um, if you if you've worked with a lender who have closed uh multiple deals and on their uh pre-approval, they use that to be determined. Um, and with that same exact uh to be determined, they have turned around and closed multiple deals with you uh with that pre-approval, you know. Um what is what is your uh I guess what is your advice in regards of that? If wait a minute, if it's a yeah. say that again, if the buyer has closed, this lender has closed multiple deals with the same buyer. Is that what you No, with, uh, different buyers, but their pre-approval has always had. Oh, so you mean the agent knows that <laughs> that bank has closed? Listen, we all know. I, I don't have to say if you've been in this business, you know good banks and bad banks. We all know that. You know, some banks are bad. Some banks are better than others. Okay. There, there are banks when I see it, I cringe. I'm like, hell no. I mean, I'm sorry. Heck no. There are banks that I know are better than others. So, you know, that's, okay. you know, I, so I, more, how do I, well, I'm sorry, go on, Demetrius. I was about to say, so it's more based off of the, uh, the, the bank, the name of the bank or. Who, who I, I, that's why that. I want to know what bank I'm dealing with. Cause there are banks that I'm telling my seller that, you know, you get to make the ultimate decision. I never make a decision for anyone, but I can tell you the last five deals that my office had with this bank, none of them closed on time. Two of them died. That's information. I'm, this is my client. I have to disclose information. I know this is information. I know you get to choose if you want this bank or not. Now I have this other offer, this bank, I know well, this agent, I know well, I think we got a better chance of going to settlement with this bank and that bank. I, I have an obligation to share that information and I do. That's why I want to know what I bank I'm dealing with. Yes. I'm Philip. Philip Edathel. If the mortgage contingency is waived, so it uh -huh. is assumed it is cash, but if there is a home inspection contingency and there are issues with the home inspection, does that give you the way out for the buyer? Absolutely. That could be repairs needed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The mortgage contingency has nothing to do with the home inspection contingency. You can waive, you can pay cash, but you can elect a, a home inspection. Now, here's what I'm going to get to in a minute. Even, and here's something I want all agents to make sure, especially newer agents, new, old agents, probably seasoned agents probably know. Even if you waive the home inspection, Philip, I think it was Philip who said, even yeah. if you waive the home inspection, there's still a way for a buyer to terminate the contract. 
agents should tell, seller's agents should tell their sellers that simply waiving a home inspection does not mean that the buyer still can't terminate it somewhere else. One, if there's a mortgage contingency in there, we know that if the lender comes back and says there are repairs, the buyer can, if the seller won't make those repairs, the buyer can say, I want out. But remember, there's also the, the UNO. If you're buying a property, if you waive a home inspection, most sellers assume there there are no repairs or they they can't ask for repairs. Well, what if the if you didn't if you if there's a UNO involved and the city says there are certain repairs and that need to be made in order for you to get a UNO to sell this property, and the seller needs to make those repairs and the seller says I'm not making them, and then the buyer gets to determine to decide whether he or she's going to make them or terminate the contract. So the so there are ways for a buyer to still walk away. So if you want to be strictly as is, you need to put in there that the seller, the buyer is responsible for any repairs that the township requires of the seller at the buyer's expense. Because you have to, because they're that way, right? Let, let's look at that when we're talking about that. Go go to what is, I think it's paragraph 15 on this, because I see this a lot where agents say, wait, which of the as is, as is. Well. Well, you, there is no there's essence. still, there's still a, yeah, there's still a, um, look at um, 15 notices, assessments, and municipal requirements. It says, and if then any notices of public and or private assessments are described in paragraph 10A, I mean 10F, I received, well, this is something different, but let, let's look at this while we talk about it. I received after the seller signed this agreement and before this settlement, seller will have five days of reviewing the notice and an assessment provide a copy. So if the seller, after the seller signs this contract and the seller gets a notice of a violation uh, from the city saying that you need to take care of this violation, then that seller has an obligation within five days to notify the buyer of that violation. And then if the, it says two, the seller cannot comply with this notice or they can comply with the notice. They can make the required, they can make the repairs or, I mean, I'm sorry, the buyer, is, I'm sorry, that the seller does not comply. Then the buyer has a choice of making the repairs him or herself. That's 2A. Or the buyer can terminate this contract. The buyer can say, you know what? I'm not making these repairs at my expense. I'm walking away. So that's, a, all right. And then the other, which I was really talking about, B, if required by law, and most, and it is, within 30 days from the execution date, but in no case, in no case later than 15 days prior to settlement, the seller, not the buyer, the seller will order at the seller's expense a certification from the appropriate municipal department disclosing uh, notice of uncorrected violations of zoning, housing, building, safety, or fire ordinances and or a certificate permitted occupancy of the property. Out in the suburbs, you definitely need that UNO. In the city, we get that resale certificate. Uh, but if the city or that township requires certain repairs and that seller says, I'm not making repairs, take a look at B. Uh, if is that one of the, yeah. I'm sorry, look at yeah. step one. Within five days of receiving the notice, the seller has to give a copy to the buyer. Okay, they get this UNO sell, and it has violations. Even if they have violations, they need to give it to the seller. I mean, to the buyer. Buyer receives a UNO saying there are repairs that need to be made. What made? What can happen? A. The buyer can make the required repa uh, repairs or improvements to the satisfaction of the township. If the seller makes the, re the required repairs, then the buyer has to accept the property. But the seller could not make the repairs. And uh, if the seller chooses not to make the repairs, then the buyer can either do one or two things. The buyer can say, I accept it as it is, I can make the repairs, or I can terminate this contract, this agreement by written notice to the seller with all the positive monies returned to the buyer. So here is another way, even if you waive the home inspection, but you don't, you don't deal with this paragraph 15 with their the, 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 you know, resale certificate or UNO, the buyer still has an out. You don't want to be in a position where you come into a seller saying, hey, seller, the buyer is not going to, it's, it's going to walk away from this deal. They're going to, wait a minute. It was a cash transaction as is. What are you talking about? They're buying and walking away. Well, because you've got, there's a, you ordered a UNO, there's some repairs. You're not going to make them because it's as is. And the buyer says, I'm not going to make them. I'm terminating this contract and I get the, I get my earnest money deposit back. Sellers are probably not going to be terribly happy with that. 
Condo or planned community. What was that? Condo or a planned community, they can also get out five days prior. Absolutely. That's something we'll cover. Absolutely. Sue's right. A condo, that's a quote. With a condo, if you ever sell in condos, Sue will probably agree. Order those condo documents ASAP because you want those in the hands of the buyer as soon as possible because the buyer can back out before they get the condo documents or up to five days after. And let me say this, when she was you cannot change that. That is that is mandated by law. A seller or buyer cannot change that five days. Uh, take a look at it while we talk about it. Look at 16, paragraph 16. We'll go back. Um, first, when it says that the condo plan community, it says property is, if the property is a condominium, it says section 3, 3407 of the Uniform Condominium Act of PA requires sellers to furnish buyers with a certificate of resale and copies of the condominium declaration, the bylaws, and the rules and regulations of the association. They go down to C. It says the following applies to resales of properties that are part of a condominium or a planned community. Within 15 days from the execution date of this agreement, at the seller's expense, the seller will request from the association a resale, a certificate of resale, and any other documents necessary to enable the seller to comply with the relevant act. The act provides uh, and that the association required to provide these documents within 10 days. Now, I have sold many condos in my day, and, and condominium associations sometimes don't seem to know that they have 10 days by law to get these documents to the seller. You make sure if you don't have within 10 days, you remind the seller or you go to, you call the condo association and say, you know, the con the, if you look at the Uniform Condominium Act of PA, that is, they only have 10 days to get these documents to that seller. Look at three. It says the act, we're talking about the uh, the condominium, the Uniform Condominium Act, the PA, provides that buyers may declare this agreement void at any time uh, before the buyer receives the association documents and for five days after receipt. So if you're selling a condo, my my I believe that you should get the seller to order the condo documents ASAP. Because up until the fact, up until the day that that buyer receives the condo documents and five days thereafter, the buyer can say, for any reason now, it doesn't have to be a reason. They look at the condo docs and say, I don't, want to have, I don't want to buy this condo. They can back away. So get the condo docs as soon as possible. And that five days, this is a legally mandated time period and cannot be shortened by the party. So you cannot cross that out and say one day or two days, the buyer has by law five days to determine whether or not he or she will move forward with the purchase of this condo once this buyer receives the condo docs. Trent, yeah. time for a break. All right, you all want a break? Yeah, we can take a... It break. is um, 10 20, let's say uh, 10 35. All right. Seven minutes, six minutes. I don't believe in breaks, but you all won't break. Let's oh, break. my goodness. You're the one who suggested it. No, no I only no suggest it because people say, don't we need a break? I need a bathroom break, but I'm good. Let's take a break. Actually, she had a question. Uh, that uh, was me. <clears throat> what was what was the question? Oh, so this is a twofold. I'm I'm I represent the seller condominium. Um, <laughs> we asked that the buyer if the buyer wanted to still have an inspection, that was okay for that. But what we asked that they did was in the in the um, on the agreement of sale, we had them list that um, buyer is accepting that the, the the appliances and unit are being sold as is condition, and inspection is for informational purposes only. So okay. we had them write that in there. And then what I did was I asked that just today, I asked that they also provide a reply to inspection, where it says home inspection. And it also still says, it reiterates for informational purposes only per the IOS. Like would that also in, in a way protect my seller from that? We have the condo docs ordered. So hopefully they arrive by the 30th. Um, that's the thing. Would that protect them, my my seller? Because we've had them write that on the agreement of sale. What the for protect for information only per 
for informational purposes only? Yeah, and we made sure that it also said let me, that let me it say is this. being sold as is. Buyers accept that the unit and appliances are being sold as is condition. Inspection is for informational purposes well, only. Let me, let me tell you, and I may be wrong, so I can disagree with me. Let me just say this. I have no idea what for informational purposes only means. I see yeah. that when people do a home inspection, it, what does it mean? Because if you give me a contract that says, the buyer is doing a contract, uh, doing a home inspection for informational purposes only. What the heck does that mean? Because it still means that, does it mean that the buyer can still back out of the deal if he or she's not pleased with the results? Or are you saying that the buyer has to go forward with the deal even if the buyer is not happy with the results of the home inspection? I don't know what that means. I won't ever take a contract with for informational purposes only. You either waive the home inspection or you don't. That's how I've always viewed it because I don't know what it means. I, I'm serious. I don't know what that means because I believe that if that buyer waives a home inspection, I mean, chooses a home inspection, then that buyer can back out of the contract. If you don't want them backing out of the contract, make them waive the home inspection. I'll tell buyers, hey, we'll allow you to go in the house and do a home inspection on uh, any day you want, but the contract is going to say is waived, is no home inspection contingency. But if you want to go do one, and I'm not even sure if I would do that because then they still have to turn it over to me and my seller. So even if it does not go through, now my seller has a home inspection report that they now need to reveal all the defects with the property. So I think that I wouldn't even take that. I wouldn't even let you do that. Even if it says that it's like buyer accepts the condition as is condition appliances and property. But, but you're saying, but you elected a home inspection, yeah. right? Yeah. I, you see the comment. Am I wrong? Some agents, <laughs> uh, experienced agents, I don't know what that means. I wait, I elect the home inspection, but then I say it's for informational purposes only. And mm -hmm. I read, I don't know what that means because the agreement says that if you're not pleased with the results of the home inspection, you can terminate the contract, the buyer that is and get his or her money back. I just think it's confusing. I have never taken an agreement sale that says for information only purposes, I say either waive it or, or elect it, period. That makes right. sense, Dawn, I'm not- You know, it does, it's just that we had, we definitely, we had two offers. One was cash waiving it, but my, sell, my, my seller actually chose the mortgage. And I had a conversation with him saying, you know you have more options of this falling apart as yeah. opposed to the cash where they're waiving it only because it's a 10-day difference and a $5,000 difference. You know, I was like, so, but I left it up to my buyer and it got to the point where I just went, you know, maybe to eliminate one of the contingencies like them have, like, <laughs> I don't know. I was just, I was upset, but I could not tell him, please choose cash. I can't, and of course, you never can, the seller always gets, a, or the client always makes a decision. I never yeah. tell a client what to do. But yeah. in that case, I just, I, I, that for informational purposes only drives me nuts because I don't understand it. Right. But I just, I, I just tried to do something because he was just, he was, he was stuck on that. And I went, okay. I like, and I, and I understand <laughs> that. <laughs> All right. Let me ask you. I have a question. <laughs> This is Thank Philip. You, this You're is welcome. Philip Adathil. Can you hear me? Yes. In the beginning, when you started this standard agreement of sale, how to fill it, you said it is your suggestion or recommendation. Do not show your address. But no, I that is, it, right, I, I right. understand that is your recommendation. Right. right. Now, that's not a recommendation. Suggestion. I said, no, I just said that's what I do. I didn't tell yeah, you. Yeah, I, I got don't. it. I right, got it. Right, right. My question is, it is not just the agreement of sale that has the address. I don't show it on anything. I don't show it on anything. So remove from all that's, the other documents. Yes, I don't show buyer's addresses. That's my okay, personal thing. That, that, I don't. Got it. Thank you. Because I had that one experience, and one yeah. experience with me is enough. I believe this woman was discriminated against because of her address, and I, I my job mm. is to protect my clients. And that, okay. that. All right, you. let's go back to paragraph. Let's go back to uh, where were we? Uh, I, we I have around. a question. Um, hello, can I yes. ask? Yeah. So, what about FHA repairs? Even what about if the, the 
FHA repairs. What what about them? If home inspection is waived, if then something the, comes back. Right. If the way if you waive the home inspection, but you have an FHA loan and FHA requires certain repairs before the buyer can get a, a loan, then somebody's got to make them in order for that loan. The seller could say no. Seller can always say no and say, pay buyer, you can make them. Or the buyer could say no and walk away because they won't get approved for the loan. But again, that's something you should decide up front. If you're waiving the home inspection, you should address what will happen if FHA and FHA is always going to have something, okay? Yep. I don't. If, it's always going to be something, maybe minor, but who's going to make those repairs and at whose expense? Address that up front in agreement. If you if you have an FHA loan and you really buy it as is, uh, I've had a lot of times where buyers responsible. Now I don't want buyers again. My policy: I'm not letting buyers come into my client's house making repairs. Because then what if they do more damage? I don't want buyers in the house. I'll tell sellers it's not a good idea to have a buyer sending over some handyman uh, woman to come in there to do some repairs and do more damage. No, I don't want that. I would rather either let the seller take care of it or the seller take care of the buyer reimbursed. But I, that's just not my, I don't think it's a good idea to have buyers, I mean, in, people in there buy, work on the house that the seller did not hire before that seller sells the house. But again, that's just my practice. But yes, if you if you waive the home inspection, yeah, still could be even conventional loan, the lender could ask for certain repairs. You got to determine who's going to do it. But remember, if the seller will make repairs, the buyer can say, I walk away. And when the buyer terminates that contract, the buyer gets his or her earnest money deposit back. So just keep that in mind. Let me try to get through this paragraph here. Um, go back to where we, the first mortgage. Um, the seller, make sure you understand that the seller can terminate this contract if they don't receive that mortgage commitment on or before that date. Look at number one. Uh, uh, number two, it says seller may terminate this agreement after the commitment date by written notice of the buyer. If the seller does not receive a copy of that, uh, that commitment, and, and uh, this is why I want you to go, I'm going to go further down until look at four. If the seller, the, everything up there is just talked about how the seller can terminate if they don't get a commitment date, of a commitment by that date. But take a look at number four. It says, if this agreement is terminated that by the seller, because you didn't get a, a commitment by time, all deposit monies will be returned to the buyer. So even some sellers, this is where I said, mentioned at the beginning, where an agent thought that if the seller terminated, because the, sell, the buyer did not provide the, con the commitment on it before the date in the contract, the seller gets to keep the buyer's earnest money deposit. No. So you need to know that because a lot of sellers don't, uh, sellers agents or agents don't seem to know that. Make sure you understand that. The paragraph four, uh, again, if this agreement is terminated, uh, basically we go up front because you don't read the mortgage commitment, all deposits will be returned to the buyer according to the terms of this contract. So, so um, buyers can, because, and why is that? Because it's not the buyer's fault, unless the buyer did something, if the buyer provided bogus tax oh. records to the, to the bank, then that's something different. Then if they, they got denied because of that, then the seller could say, hey, because you provide false information to the lender, then I'm not obligated to return it. That's something totally different. But if the buyer did everything and the lender just did not approve the loan for whatever reason, the buyer didn't do anything wrong. The buyer should be uh, be able to get uh, his or her earnest money deposit back. Trent, can I just um, say, because I have a situation right now that's happening where the buyer, the BFI, and this is, I was going to mention this later, but might as well bring it up now. The BFI did not have all the complete information. So the seller, my seller made a decision to take this buyer based on the BFI. And then we found out halfway through that the buyer did not disclose a $36,000 tax lien. And, they and now the buyer's now. saying, and then the buyer got from the, from the lender uh, uh, saying, oh, we're not approving your loan. Okay. And the buyer's saying, well, I'm due the deposit back as per this part of the contract that you just mentioned, right? Well, I, However... I the buyer didn't disclose on the buyer's financial information form 
Right. A uh, tax yes. lien. I would I would agree that they're probably not entitled, but it's like that's gonna be a legal matter, but I or a matter for ethics or arbitration. But I would agree from what you just say, I would think if you did not disclose that you have a thirty six thousand dollar tax lien on the BFI, I would probably agree that you probably aren't entitled to your money back, but that's just me. I, well, would, I, say, I would agree. I guess what I'm saying All too right. is that for anybody who's working with sellers, that a, a cautionary this is a cautionary tale that you know the, the BFI sometimes is taken for granted, and possibly from the seller side, that BFI should be questioned. Just well, to make I did, and I agree with that, but just keep in mind also sometimes just talking about the BFI when you fill out the BFI, the buyer's financial. The buyer is not obligated to put more information than they need to qualify. In other words, let's say the buyer has $500,000 in his bank account, but he needs $20,000 to close. All he has to do is show he has $20,000. He doesn't have to say, I've got $500,000 in the bank. He's have $30,000. As long as he has it, he can show he's enough. A buyer is not obligated, and that's what the buyer's financial says, to disclose all his or her assets. All you have to do is show enough that you have enough to close this loan. So, you know, because I maybe I don't want to disclose that I have a million dollars in my bank account. And now you, the seller, are going to think, wait a minute, I'm, they want this house for 400000 when, you know, and, and I've got it at four seven not 75. I would have given it to them, but they've got a million dollars in the bank. So you don't want to do that. So just keep in mind, buyers only, buyer can't lie, but a buyer is not obligated to disclose more information than they need. Right, on the asset right. side, but the right. liability side is another, yes. Yeah, right, so. liability, you have to, <laughs> right. You can't lie and say you don't have a car note, uh, four car notes when you do. That's something totally different, right. Now, let's look at paragraph five. It says, if the mortgage lender or the homeowner's insurance company, any uh, casualty insurer providing insurance required by a mortgage lender requires repairs, we talked about earlier, if the, if the lender requires repairs, Look at A, if the seller makes repairs to the satisfactory mortgage company, then the buyer has to buy the property. But look at B, if the seller will not make the repairs, then buyer always has two options. One, they can make the repairs at their expense, or two, they can terminate the contract with all deposit monies returned to the buyer. So if the lender comes back, and we just mentioned, FHA says, you need to make these certain repairs, um, the lenders, I mean, the seller says, I'm not making any repairs. And the buyer can do one of two things. The buyer can say, I'll make the repairs at my expense. Or two, the buyer can say, I just, I will terminate this contract. And I'll walk away and you return my earnest money deposit. All right? Change in terms. Make sure, this is something that I remember years ago when I was first in this business, a buyer, mm -hmm. i never forget, we're about to go to settlement and like, I think it's like three or four days before settlement, the buyer went out and bought a mm -hmm. new car. Mm -hmm. Oh Lord. Mm -hmm. And I, this was the time where I needed that money. I think my mortgage was due and I was celebrating. I said, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm gonna get money to pay my mortgage. Well, <laughs> never, never count your commission people until it's in your account. Cause I, once I had one that bounced. So I say until it clears your account. Because <laughs> once I had a check that did not clear my account. So what happened when they ran the numbers again? Now they have a new debt that was like $700 a month. Now the ratios were off. The answer is yes to that lane. The ratio is off um, and they could not be approved. So they could not buy this house and I couldn't pay my mortgage. <laughs> I mean, I did pay it, but I paid it late. <laughs> um, those are early days now so, so don't ever you know so so tell your buyers i'm sorry that was a part of that story not to go out and get furniture don't go get a new car don't this is what i tell buyers don't even give your social security number to anyone if somebody asks for your social security oh. number call me first I don't want you to give your social security number to nobody because that means they're running credit. I don't want anyone running your credit until we until you walk out of settlement with the keys in your hand. Okay? Because sellers sometimes, I mean, buyers will sometimes go buy furniture. I had another one who bought a house full of furniture, but her income was so high that, you know, she was okay. But I'm like, what did you do? She spent like 50000 at Ray Moore and Flan Flanagan. <laughs> And I'm thinking, no, you can't do that. But she had a really high income and we, she was able to close. So look at change in terms. If, the, if a change 
and the buyer's financial uh, status affects the buyer's ability to purchase, the buyer will promptly notify the seller and the lender um, to whom the buyer submitted a mortgage application. A change in financial status includes, but is not limited to, or a change in employment, failure to failure or loss of sale of buyer's home, buyers haven't incurred a new financial obligation, like buying a new house, or I mean, like buying a new car, uh, entry of a judgment against the buyer, buying the sales that applying for and or incurring an additional financial obligation may affect the buyer's ability to purchase that property. Tell buyers don't buy anything before you close on this deal. Don't give them your social security number. Don't buy anything. Don't get new credit cards. Don't do anything until you buy. You can buy whatever you want after you buy the house. But before that, don't do it. And if there is an issue, you have to notify the seller. If you just, uh, your, if you just, your hours were cut from 80 hours a week to 40, you need to notify the lender. And the seller has a right to know that because now you may not be able to buy the house. All right. Number 10, yes, if we're talking the city, it'd be public water. If you're in the suburbs, you just lower. It could be something else. But the city's public water, um, public sewer. All right. Um, Take a look at E, go to E uh, under the real estate settlement disclosure law. Uh, I think the seller's disclosure is included. When you are selling any properties that are one to four units, the seller, there are 10 exceptions to that rule. Sellers have to provide a seller or seller's property disclosure statement to the buyer. If there are any changes that occurs after the seller has completed that seller's disclosure, that seller, there is a seller's property disclosure statement addendum. Let's say they uh, they filled out the seller's disclosure, the roof was in great condition. Uh, two weeks after they filled it out, the roof starts leaking. They need to they need to revise that seller's disclosure. And there is just a one form addendum. Uh, it's called a seller's property disclosure statement addendum. You can fix uh, fill it out saying, hey, the roof leaked at, on this date. So you need to revise it or you can just change the seller's disclosure or do a new one. Um, can, a, can an agent help a buyer? I'm sorry. Can an agent help the seller complete the seller's disclosure? No. Absolutely no. not. No. The answer no. is not just no. I like nope. that. Absolutely not. <laughs> All right. I tell my agents, I don't want you to even your if fingerprints on the document. I want you to wear gloves when you handle a seller's disclosure. <laughs> I don't even want your fingerprints on it. Do not help a seller. And here's what I always tell agents. Don't sit there while a seller completes it because they're going to ask you all kinds of questions. I'll say, I can't help you. But Trent, I know, but what about, I cannot help you. I know, but what exactly? Trent, I can't help you. I know you can't, but just give it to them and say, email it to me in two or three days. Give them a few days to fill it out because a lot of information. You should look over it, make sure it's completed and make sure it's complete and tell them to complete it as accurately and honestly as possible. Don't lie, don't exaggerate, don't leave stuff out. It is better to over-disclose than under-disclose. No one's ever been sued for disclosing too much, but people have been sued for disclosing too little. And what you wanna do is, um, uh, oh, I, what I tell sellers is that in real estate, if there is a lawsuit, a lot of times in our industries because of what a seller put on a seller's disclosure. Sometimes sellers don't aren't as truthful. And so you I remind sellers that you have to fill this out as completely and as honestly as possible. If a seller calls me and says, hey, Trent, do I need to disclose? I said, yes. They said, well, you didn't let me finish my sentence. I don't care. Yes. Because if you think it's important to disclose it, whether it needs to be disclosed or not, I don't care. If you ask me, it's important enough for you to disclose it, right? I have a question. Uh, yes. In relation to that, even if there's some terminology that they just don't quite understand, I'm not saying give them answers. I mean, terminology-wise, like if they ask you, well, what does this statement mean? I don't understand how to answer this. Tell them, call Is a it, lawyer, call a friend, yep, call, yep. call Ghostbusters, call somebody. But you tell them, <laughs> I cannot help. I cannot help you fill out a seller's disclosure. So, and and, and but let me let me finish that. If they don't okay. understand it, you know what the answer is? I know. Mm -hmm. That's the answer. Okay, so that's, no, Your that's, that's is, sufficient enough. Then, that's it. If I don't understand, I tell sellers, when you fill this out, you not you don't have to be an expert. 
You don't have to go asking people. You don't have to go looking for stuff. If you don't know the answer, there's this box that says UNK. And then how does it say UN? What is it? UNK. Uh, yeah, UNK. That's unknown. Unknown. That's it. That's the truth. The seller is telling the truth. I don't understand this question. So the answer is unknown. Okay. You're not lying as long as they're being truthful, but you can't help them. You don't explain to them. No, that's the that, 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 that suffices. Yeah, that suffices. Okay. Now, let me ask this. This is some, something I bet your experienced agents will also agree with me. If you, let me ask a question first. If you are selling uh, an estate, you are the, you're selling, you're representing the executor of the estate. And the executor, it was the executor's mother's house. And the executor knew the heater was having problems. So the executor uh, had the heater repaired a few different times. Does the executor have to, first of all, does an executor have to complete a seller's disclosure? No. No. Under normal That is one of the exceptions, right? Let's look at the 10 exceptions first. Look at it. Look at, look at it. Does anybody have a seller's disclosure? There are 10 exceptions. The first one is a transfer. It says the law defines a number of exceptions where the disclosures do not have to be made. Number one, transfers that are a result of a court order. Court is requiring you to is uh is making you sell a property. You don't have to give a seller disclosure. Number two, transfer to a mortgage lender that result from a buyer's default and subsequent foreclosure. Uh, if you're losing your house in sheriff sale, not required to give a foreclosure. Number three, transfers from one co-owner one co-owner to another. We both own the property as tenants in common. I'm selling my interest to you. I'm not required to give you a seller disclosure. Number four, transfers made to a spouse. Or direct descendant. I'm selling my property to my child. Don't need to give a seller's disclosure. Number five, transfers between a spouse, between spouses that result from result from divorce. We get a divorce. The, the the court awarded my wife the property. I don't have to give her a seller's disclosure when I when I sell the property. We'll give her the property. Number six, trans, <laughs> transfers by a corporation, partnership, or other association to one of the shareholders. I have a shareholder. I'm one of the shareholders in the company. I'm buying one of the properties they own. We own. Company doesn't have to give me a seller's disclosure. Number seven, transfers of a property be demolished or converted to a non-resident to use. I'm buying a vacant piece of vacant land, not required to get a seller's disclosure. Number nine, I'm gonna come back to nine. Number 10, transfers of new construction that have never been occupied, new construction. Uh, this is a brand new house, just built, not required to give you a seller's disclosure. Number nine is where we have an issue sometimes. Transfers by fiduciary, during the administration of a deceit in the state, guardianship, conservatorship, or trust. That's where executor, executrix, administrator, administratrix comes in. Go back to my, my example. You all said that this is an exception. Yes, it is. But if that executor knows something about this property, then he or she must disclose it. Take a look at the yes. very last line on, on page 10. And most people, when they are, they are the executive, they're represented at uh, the state, they send back this uh, uh, seller's disclosure, just crossed out. Everything's crossed out, and the executor signs the last page. Look at the last page. It says, I'm the executor, administrator, trustee signature block. According to the provisions of the real estate seller disclosure law, the undersigned executor, administrator, or trustee is not required to fill out a seller's disclosure statement. We all agree with that. But take a look at the next line. The executor, administrator, or trustee must, however, disclose any known material defects of the property. So yes. if you're the executor and you know the roof leaked, you must disclose it. If you know the heater is bad and you that maybe you lived in the house with your mother, maybe you were there, you're the one who paid to have the roof coated. Whatever you know as the executor or executrix, you must disclose. Trent, mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. This is going on right now for me. In the middle of a real estate transaction to sell the house, my seller died. Okay. Oh. We were in the middle of negotiating the home inspection. Uh huh. And in that process, the seller had verbally agreed to things 
uh, that we were supposed to have met on to sign off on. And over Brian, the weekend, let me, let me say, you said a key word that I didn't hear anything else after that. When you say verbal, verbal. I ain't done nothing else after verbal. There's no such thing as a verbal contract. Agreement said, you know that. Yes, I understand. On. So now here we are. The seller is deceased. Do so I now, need, so my, my, my major question is, do I need to have the executor of the estate re-sign all of the paperwork, even the listing contract? Now that's interesting. I, do they need to, I would have them, yes, I would. I would. I would do a new, I would, but do you, but then, now, I, 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 you know what, I'm not a lawyer, but that's a, that's a question pardon, I'm not, I'm not 100% pardon, sure. Pardon not, me, Trent. Uh, hold on, yeah. Go on, Cheryl. Hard legal. Yes. Uh, that's the benefit yeah. of your membership. Yeah, and I would. Call. That's a yeah. Call the legal hotline on that. I'm not sure. Let me say what I would do. I always do more than I need to. I would ask a, the executor to resign everything with new listing. I would, but I don't know. If that's a more of a legal question. You could call the uh, the par legal hotline or contact a lawyer, but. I, yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but I would want them to sign everything because now, yeah, I, I would. And I, so ask, call, and it's, and it's free. And thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl, uh, it is free. It's open to anybody as a realtor. We have access to the to the PAR legal hotline and they're very good. So that's a question for them. Well, and I would love to know the answer. Trent, okay. I have a thought. That, that the executor represents the estate. Think about that. So, what are you saying, Vincent? Well, there's other people involved, not just not just the uh, uh, what do you call it, not just the owner. So they can't they can't say the same thing that the owner said, right? And I agree. That's why I would have them. I would I would you think definitely talk to a lawyer. Definitely. Yeah, but I would think they, a lawyer would tell you to sign, have them sign over. I would think so. Sue, you say something. So I'm thinking about this. If I'm if I'm representing the buyer, I don't think. Wait, I thought he was representing the seller. Wait, Brian. I'm representing the seller. The seller. Oh, I know he is, but if I'm okay. representing the buyer, I mean, I'm just I'm not a lawyer either. But I legally signed my buyer signed a contract with the right. seller. Okay, so I don't know. I don't know either. Do I, I want that executor to be signing everything, especially the seller's disclosure, where he could put that he doesn't know anything, and we've already negotiated the price, we already negotiated inspections. I agree I with know. you. But I don't seller, know. The seller's not love, there to sign the altar. <laughs> yeah, I would love to know the answer to that. I, I now I'm curious. I may have to call legal hotline myself. <laughs> I would love to. I would love to know. I don't. That's interesting, Brian. You got to find out the answer. And Trent. call us back. Okay. Trent. Uh, someone... Trent, hey, I Lisa. Had a Lisa. Yeah. Yes. You know how sometimes you just have to say um, sometimes the initial is different and the bank may ask for seller X is now changed to seller. Right. So something similar, you know, seller, whatever the name was, is now changed to, to the estate of whatever the name was. Mm -hmm. And then possibly go through. But Legal hotline again. None of us are attorneys. Exactly. That's all right. So let's move on. But that's very yeah, interesting. I have a quick question. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Um, I'm dealing with not that part of it, but just the estate part. Um, just yesterday, uh, the listing agent responded and um, said that it's an estate. Well, I requested the SPD and the LPD. I didn't realize that it was an estate. And he said, it, it'll be blank. It's an estate. I said, okay, I didn't realize it was an estate, but he, it still needs to be dated and, and signed. signed. Right. And if it's blank. Right. It still needs to be signed and dated. Okay. But, and, and, and I don't agree where I get an estate, I get a seller's code and just mark every page marked through, especially if the person knew something about the property, because a lot of executors are, the, are children or relatives of the person who died and they know something about the house. You still need to disclose what you know. If my if I'm the executor of my mother's estate and my mother died today, I know some of the stuff about the house because I paid for some of the stuff when there was some. So I would have to disclose that. But but let's move on. Um, look at let's go um, public and private uh, assessments. I just want that number two. Look at number two. Should you should you um, if you know you're selling a condo. 
and the sell the condo board is thinking about raising the condo fees by three hundred dollars a month. They've been in discussion. You're the seller's agent. Would you disclose that? But it's, the condo board hadn't made a decision yet. Would you disclose that to a potential buyer? You were the that seller. You're the seller. To the to the new any potential buyer, you represent the seller. Seller selling the condo, condo boards. Uh, the last few months, they've been talking about possibly last year, they've been talking about possibly raising the condo fees by three, four hundred dollars, but they haven't done it. They haven't made a decision on it yet. And now you put an all you put a con you you put the condo on the market. Do you disclose that to a potential buyer that information? Well, isn't the seller supposed to disclose what the seller knows? I would no. I'm asking. Would you disclose that? Yes, the seller's yes, been yes. notified. I would, I would look yes. at number. Okay, I would agree because some people don't do it. I would disclose it. Look at number two, F two. Seller knows of no other potential notices because you have to you have to disclose everything to seller or include violations mm -hmm. and or assessments except as follows. Mm -hmm. I believe that if the seller knows, and I had that actually happen where the condo board for the last year were talking about doubling the condo fees. And when I got, we went back and got the minutes every month, they had a meeting and they discussed it. And they, the, the month after my client bought the condo, they doubled the condo fees. They voted to double. And he was like, wait a minute, oh, should yeah. they have, should they have disclosed that to me? I said, well, you need to contact the lawyer. I, you know, but I believe that should have been disclosed. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that the, um, uh, he did win. He was the seller. The, the seller settled and ended up paying like for two years of those fees. But I believe if you know something, you ought to disclose it. You shouldn't hide it because it comes back to bite you in the behind. All right, let's go to um, let's go over the twelve buyers' due diligence inspections. Um, paragraph twelve. Seller will. First of all, seller will provide access to everybody. We already talked about that. And, and sellers need to make sure all utilities are on at the time. Number two, this is something I have to tell buyers because buyers love to bring their mama and daddy, their sister, their aunt and grandparents and all these people to, <laughs> to a home inspection. Their best girlfriend, their children of the girlfriend, the neighbor, the plumber's daughter's wife. And I get 20 people come with a home inspection. You tell them no. And you cannot keep coming in and out of someone's house. Seller, buyer will make two pre-settlement walkthroughs of the property. Two, tell buyers you can go on this property two times after the home inspection. First, I'm talking about don't bring a bunch of people to home inspection. Um, um, because it also says who you can bring to a home inspection. But let's look at two. Buyer can only make two pre-settlement walkthroughs, not four or five, unless they get permission from the seller. Some sellers don't want buyers in the house every other day. Buyers' rights to these inspections, not waive that's on. So seller will have all heating and utilities on for all inspections. Make sure that's true. Verify this. But here, look at the next one. Five. This is where a lot of buyers, you know, buyers' agents, make sure you show this to your buyer. You tell your buyers' clients this. Seller has a right. No, I'm sorry. That's not what I want. Where's the one that I might say they can only bring? Oh, I'm sorry. Number one. Number one. It says... Only parties, the last part of that paragraph, only parties and their real estate licensees may attend any inspections. Only the parties named in the contract and the licensees. This is the home inspection. It's not the time when you bring your whole family to look at the house. <laughs> if you want to bring people, then you should negotiate it up front. Hey, my father's going to come to the home inspection. We'll put that in the contract. Negotiate, hey, I want to change it so that my, the parties and my father will be at a 10. Fine. But you cannot bring, and I, I remember it was last year, I was, I was in Florida, and I got a frantic call from a seller, a selling house in Upper Darby, or Darby, Upper Darby, big house. And I get a frantic call. I was at the doctor, and she was livid. She says, Trent, who are all the neighbors called and said there are like 30 people at the house? They exaggerated, but it wasn't far. The, I had to sell the buyer brought she was the buyer was buying it buyer has three children her boyfriend was there so they were there the buyer brought her parents her aunt her aunt's husband <laughs> the boyfriend brought his mother his brother his best friend <laughs> and, what is it? and I think a sister was there and her husband and then the home inspector the termite person the radar person so there was all these people so that the, the, so she called me in a in a panic 
And I had to call the agent and say, hey, you can't have, you got to get all these people out. And so that's what I said. You, you need to, you need to ask these people to leave. They can't, there's like 15 people in this house. And she, they did, they had to leave. I mean, I said, you know, you can keep, you know, a few people, but my God, 15 people. So make sure buyers, this is not the time for buyers to bring their whole family and their whole neighborhood to see a property. I have a question. Trent. Yes. What about the home inspectors that bring more than one home inspector, say three or four home inspectors, or Three five, or and, and the seller can't keep track of these people that are in their house. I've never heard. That's just, I've never seen an inspector that brought through. Maybe, well, it, maybe I exaggerated, but okay, by three. <laughs> how many exaggerated? Yeah, say, say, say three. Yeah, say three. All right, I'm gonna say you exaggerated by three. All right, Greg. <laughs> I, I think that's probably okay because that's it. It says, remember, look what it says. <laughs> Only parties and their licensees may attend the inspection. Well, the inspector is one of the, is not a party to grievous sale, but the inspector is doing the home inspector. Inspection. If the inspector needs two other people, that would be fine. I have never, and I tell, I've been doing this for long, but I've never seen more than one inspector ever. And I mean, I never. So if it's maybe you use the wrong inspection company, uh, Greg. Uh, <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. I'm only kidding with you, but that should be okay. You should be able to say an inspector, if an inspector needs two other people, you that should be okay. I just never had has anybody ever seen that happen where an inspector brings multiple people with them? Well, maybe I, I've 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 been in a case where the inspector will bring somebody who might come in, you know, maybe like training. Yeah, yeah, trainer. Somebody come in with a train person. Yeah, that, that I can see. Mm -hmm. Right, or All somebody right. Do stucco. Maybe there's an, a stucco inspection, which is a separate thing. I, you know. Right, right. All right. Look at five. I want to be clear here because people read this wrong. Look at seven, twelve, five. Seller has a right upon request to receive a free copy of any any inspection reports from the party for home repair. <laughs> They're not talking about a home inspection report here. I had a broker call me just a couple of days ago. He was mad because the seller, I mean, he is a seller. The buyer did a home inspection and sent the home inspection report to him. He said, I don't want the home inspection. I kept telling her, don't send the home inspection. Trent, am I wrong? I said, yes. He said, well, I don't want it. I don't have a, I said, no. This is the mean. contract says that the buyer's agent must or will give the entire inspection report to the seller. I don't agree, I don't with, agree that. with that. Oh, oh, I, I, I'm hearing an echo. I'm hearing an echo. Hello? All right. I, I, um, I, um, I think going. we need to mute everybody. Because somebody, I, I'm hearing an echo. Uh, it's, maybe it's gone. The, the, this is talking about any inspection reports other than, let's say, now, if I'm the seller, do I want inspection reports that the buyer had done? No. Do you want those? Of course. No. You no. Now, I can tell you, and I have 100 people on here, I can tell you when I was on the professional standards, this is where I had a serious problem with this paragraph. Well, we go to, let's go to 13 for a minute. I totally disagree with this, but I live by whatever's in this contract. Look at inspection contingency. The contingency period, if you leave it blank, it's 10. I believe you should put 10 if you want to be 10 from the execution date. If you do a home inspection, look at B1. If the results of the home inspection are not satisfied to the buyer, look what this says. Buyer will, it's in all caps, will, not shall, not may, will present all reports in their entirety to the seller. And then they can accept the property, blah, blah, blah. So what, even if you do a home inspection, you don't want any repairs, no credits, you still must give that entire inspection report to the seller. Do I agree with that? No, I don't think a seller, unless a seller wants it, you shouldn't force it on it, but that's just me. Number two, if the results of an inspection are unsatisfactory, the buyer can walk away and what? Terminate the contract and present all reports in their entirety to the seller. Do I want a home inspection report? I didn't know my roof was bad, but now I know. So now as a seller, I need to disclose that. And number three, 
If, if the result of an inspection elected in the paragraph are unsatisfactory, the buyer will still present all the reports in the, in the entirety, not just portions of it, the entire report to the seller with a written corrective proposal. So I want you to do fix the roof, for instance, but I can't just send, I used to just say, send me the portion about the bad roof. But now you have to send me the whole report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem here is whatever, if they, if this deal dies, the next buyer needs, I just sent them that report, because, or the seller needs to go back and amend their seller's disclosure because now they know information that they didn't know before the inspection report. I personally have a problem with that. I don't think it's fair that a seller is forced to get an inspection report where they didn't order. They don't know who the inspector is. They don't know if that inspector made mistakes. And now this thing, they have to reveal, they have to disclose the information in this inspection report to another potential buyer. I think it only hurts the buyer. And when I was on this committee, I told this story why I hate it so much. I was representing the seller once. Buyer gives us a, a home inspection report. They back out because they say you got mold. There's mold all over the basement. The seller says, Trent, would you just get me a mold remediation person? I said, okay. We get a mold person to come down. I let him in because she was at work. And he I, he's in the basement. He starts laughing. And I went down and said, what's so funny? He said, Trent, this is not mold. I said, what is it? He says, it's dirt. Oh, man. So now I have an inspection report that says it's mold. I have to give it to the new buyers. Now I have a, a, a mold remediation expert saying it's not mold. We, he gives us a report. Now I have to give that. Now I want you to think. A potential buyer gets a home inspection report from a third party saying there's mold. Then somebody the seller hired says no mold. Who do you think they're going to believe? The, the inspection report. They don't believe there's mold. Mm -hmm. And they're going to they're gonna lower the price because of that. That was one of the reasons, one of the stories I told, because I think it's not fair. But what we need to know is that you always have to send the entire report to the seller, whether the seller wants it or not. It does, don't, you just, once you do that, you receive it by email, right away forward to the seller's agent. Many seller's agents are still old-fashioned. They don't know this here. And they think that, they say, I don't want it. I never wanted it. I usually say, don't send that to me. Mm -hmm. And if they send it to you, don't say, I ain't open it. Well, you, you have it now. So you better give it to yourself. But you need to send it to your, well, let me go back up. You need to send it to your seller. Um, where are we? Where, well, let me finish on that 12. Where, where Oh, I'm somewhere else. Uh, oh, um, I'll go back. Go back up. Uh, up twelve. I was on twelve. Uh, look at the look at the uh, the home inspector. If you're going to waive or elect it, the home inspector. If you're going to elect it, here's one thing no one ever does. But I think you should you should initial it and date it. I've never seen anyone date it. Again, never. Don't put an X here. Don't let a seller or buyer put an X. Because sometimes buyers will come back and say, I didn't put an X there. I don't know how that X got there. I didn't mean to waive it. I meant to elect it. You don't have that problem if you have the buyer initial and date. I always, now I saw once uh, someone that happened, it was an office, another office where the buyer said, I meant to elect, but the X was in the wave. And the buyer said that the agent must have put that. I didn't do it. Well, if you had the initials and the date, then it's hard to say that somebody else did it. I just think it's a good practice. Listen, I don't have a lot of issues. And Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. What box are you talking about? I'm sorry. What box are you talking about? Not a box. On the elected and waived on under mm -hmm. paragraph 12. You see mm -hmm. home inspection, wood infestation. You see where it says elected and waived, mm -hmm. where you can elect a home inspection and waive. It's not a box. It's just a line. I maybe said box. Just a line where you initial it. I mean, where you put an X, if I'm going to, usually what you'll get back is elected X, uh, would inspect it uh, X. I believe you should have them initial and date. I've never seen it in my life since I've been in this business, but it only takes one buyer to come back and say that I didn't put that X. And I believe that I don't want a lawsuit. I don't want any kind of uh, issues. I like to do things so I don't have issues. 
Don't put X's because it could come back and harm you. All right, have them initially. Or if you don't have to, and date. I would all, anytime you put initial, you should put a date, I just believe. So if they're gonna do a home inspection, if they're gonna waive it or elect it, wood infestation, basically termites, um, radon. Now, one thing with radon, even if they say, I don't wanna do radon, have them in, elect it. But if they don't do it, it's just waived. If it just goes away. But don't, radon is something a lot of people say, I'm not going to do. I always say, listen, just elect it and you choose to do it. You can, if you choose not to do it, you don't have to. Let's go down to, I'm good, running out of time, I know. Let's go, let's go down to, go back to inspection contingency. All right, so go back to that first paragraph. So within 10 days, if you were the bank, you have 10 days to do a home inspection. All your inspections must be done in 10 days. That's 10 days. That is not, um, that is not eight days. I mean, that's not 11 days. It's like 15 days. That's 10 days to do a home inspection. All right, go over to paragraph, um, go over to 3A. Following the contingency period, because if you have 10 days to do a home inspection, that is called your contingency period. Now, after the contingency period, it says following the end of the contingency period. So if you, if you do the home inspection early, you don't lose the dates. You have those 10 days, you just have more time to do the negotiation period. So look at A, following the end of the contingency period, buyer and seller will have, if, you, if it's blank, it's five days for what they call a negotiation period. Doing the negotiation, so you have 10 days to do a home inspection, five days to do a home, the negotiation period, so that's 15 days. If you finish the home, if you, you do the home inspection within five, that means you have 10 days for the negotiation period, all right? Um, if this, the, at, the, at the end of the negotiation period, if the buyer and the seller has not reached any kind of, they haven't decided what they're going to do, if no mutually acceptable written agreement is reached, or if the seller fails to re uh, respond to the buyer during that negotiation period, then following the end of the negotiation period, the buyer can say, okay, I'm just going to take the property as it is. We can't, we can't uh, figure out what repairs he, the buyer the seller is willing to do or pay or credit. So I'm just going to take it as it is or I'm going to terminate it and seller return my earnest money deposit. All right. So you have, I'm sorry, I think I jumped ahead of myself. Let me, let me say this again. I think I, I said something incorrect. You have 10 days to do a, a home inspection. That's your contingency period. Then you have five days after that contingency period to do the, do the negotiation. After the negotiation period, you have two. Now look at B. I skipped though. If no mutually agreeable, acceptable agreement is reached, or if the seller fails to respond to a negotiation period, then you have two days for either the buyer to decide to either accept the property as is or terminate the contract with his or her earnest money deposit return. Any questions? I if have a not, question. Yes. Sorry. So doesn't, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't know. Doesn't the buyer get those 10 days, whether he finishes the report on the fifth day? Doesn't yes. He still get yeah. The so I'm saying he just adds it. So they just add it to the negotiation period. That's all. Because remember, it says at the end of the negotiation period, the negotiation period is 10 days. Yes, the buyer has those 10 days. Let's say that buyer does a home inspection five and submit, submits a written corrective proposal. It just means they have 10 days for the negotiation and not five. So that five goes to the negotiation, goes towards yeah. the negotiation? Yeah, because yeah, they're not losing. Because you remember the contingency period is not over for 10 days. So you just start to go, or you just start negotiation early, but you're not losing the time. That's all. You're not losing the time. Yeah. However you look at it, you still have 10 days Okay. Uh, the contingency period is not over. It says, remember, for the before the negotiation period can start, it has to, the the, the contingency period has to end, and you have ten days for that. So you can't. So you just have more time for the negotiation period. That's all. All right. Fourteen title surveys and costs. Within here's one that I definitely think you ought to change, and I'm sure people would agree with this. Would you? Do you think it's seven days within seven days from the execution date of this agreement? Bar will order a title report. Would you order a title report within seven days? You haven't done a home inspection. You don't even know if the buyer is going to go forward with the property. I would never leave seven. I would put maybe 15, 
because let me do the home inspection first to see if the buyer is going to go forward before I go order a, 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 a title. Because if the buyer is not going forward, then some title companies charge a cancellation fee to that buyer. Well, I don't want my client paying a cancellation fee. Let me just order the title right after we know we're moving forward with this transaction. Maybe I'm wrong. Do you all, do you all what do you think? Do you think seven days is enough? Well, there was a time, like for instance, in Philadelphia, this is not recent, recent, but there was a time in Philadelphia where title companies were saying, listen, we are swamped and we don't know if we can meet settlement date you know, if you wait, you know, that's, that's just a lot of, it's just. And that's possible, but then, then, yeah, that's possible if they, and I've been around where it's, they, they said, listen, we're busy, but I'm not talking, I'm not talking about some time where they just, they just so busy, but seven days, would you order a title before you did the home inspection? Maybe you do, but that just, I think you should, well, I'm not gonna tell you how to do your business, but I just think seven is just not enough time. I would I would probably change that. All right, now here's one thing that you, if the buyer, if the seller cannot deliver marketable title to the buyer, can the buyer be reimbursed for all his or her expenses, like the home inspection, the mm -hmm. appraisal, all the monies that he or she put out? Could yes. that buyer be reimbursed? Yes. Does everybody agree with Dawn? Mm, you can try right. but i all right. Yeah. all right let's 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 look in here i'm glad we said that because some agents don't know that dawn is correct take a look at this look at c buyer will pay for the following title search title insurance number two flood insurance fire insurance homeowners insurance three appraisal fees and four customary uh buyers customary closing costs and five d any survey E, it says that the property will be conveyed with good and marketable title that is insurable by a reputable title insurance company, regular rates, free and clear of all liens, encumbrances, and easements. F, here's the kicker here. This is what you want to know. If a chain, no, I'm sorry. Accepting, however. Where, what did I just, what was I just? E. Um, did I lose, wait a minute. Wait, where, where am I missing? Where, where am I? Where, 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 where letter am I? Read G. Line 507E. Read G. I think it's G. I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, it's G. I'm going to say, I, I'm not saying, okay, I'm going to say I'm missing something. It's G. Look at G. That's what I'm sorry. Okay. If the seller is unable to give good and marketable title that is insurable by a reputable title insurance company at regular rates, the buyer can terminate the contract. And of course, always when they terminate, they can get the money back. But take a look at that sentence that says, upon termination, all deposit monies will be returned to the, I'm sorry, upon termination, all deposit monies, which I'm sorry, I'm trying to say, seller will reimburse, well, let me finish this. Upon termination, all deposit monies will, shall be returned to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of the agreement. And seller will reimburse the buyer for any cost incurred by the buyer for any inspections or certifications obtained according to the terms of the agreement. And for those things listed, 14C1, remember that's title insurance, title policy, 14C2, that was homeowner's insurance, 14C3, I think that was appraisal, and in paragraph 14D, that was a survey. So yes, if the seller cannot sell the property for whatever reasons, the seller can't sell it, maybe they owe too much, um, the buyer can say to the seller, I put out 700 for the appraisal, 600 for home inspection, termite, radon, I paid for, I prepaid my homeowner's insurance, flood insurance. Now, seller, you need to reimburse me and they would be correct. And how is that, how is that yeah. uh, actually Good executed? <laughs> yeah. Write them a letter, send them a letter saying this contract says, or get a lawyer or go to arbitration, how you do it. I've had it happen. I just say to the seller, I'm not doing it for them. I said to the buyer, send a letter, point out an agreement sale that says that because you can't deliver remarkable title, you can't sell the property. Here's a list of my expenses. I included an invoice of each one. I need you to, within 20 days, 30 days, please remit a check for $2,500. And if, if you're not, then you take it 
then you go further. But it's right there. They have to reimburse you. You're entitled to it. I've had it happen once and the seller didn't know it was there. Seller's agent didn't know it was there. But when they learned it was there, they sent the check because they knew it was not the buyer's fault. The buyer should be made whole. The buyer put out $2,500 and the seller can't sell the property. The buyer didn't walk away. The seller couldn't sell the property. So it's not fair that the buyer is out $2,500. See, to me, the seller would be out that $2,500. So Trent, that's why I think this form that's, I just started sending this form to my clients, my buyers and sellers. It's a guide to the agreement of sale. Yes, that's actually good, but nobody's going to read that. Right, but <laughs> I know, but that, but then you can get them to sign. The thing is that you can sign it. Right, but buyers, another- buyers, buyers are hiring you to to explain this to them. They, if they figure if they got to read a bunch of stuff, they had to sell it on their own. They had to put a they buy a for sale by owner sign and say, I don't need, I don't need any agent because the agent delivered a book to me and said, here, read it. And, and I said, here, read it, page one through 88. But and I also we'll go over it. it with them. But I also go over it with them. And I've had people no. literally check out while I'm talking about certain things that are important. They just check out. No, so and I and, I'm only, and I agree with you yeah, that yeah, giving yeah. it to them. I yeah. mean, I went to a listing once and I, 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 it was a listing presentation. I don't do fancy stuff, but one of the big offices had, they had a beautiful, uh, it was a book was about this dog. I said, my God, what is that? Beautiful pictures and, and cops and everything. And I never forget it. It was a property in Fishtown. And the guy said, this office just left, one of the biggest companies in the, in the center city. And he said, uh, the guy gave me this book, and I have no what, no have no idea. If he thinks I'm gonna read this big old book, it's got a lot of nice pictures. I didn't hire somebody to make me read. I hired a professional so that they could sell my house. Are you gonna make me read a big book? I said no. I'm just gonna just I'm gonna tell you what you need to know, and you're gonna give me the listing, and I'm gonna sell it. And that's exactly what happened. And I said, by the way, can I take this big old book? And he said, yeah. And I did because it was a it was very very nice. <laughs> but the only thing the agent did was bring a big book and tell him to read it. And he says, I got it. He was on like, he, it was his father died and left the property. He was like 24 and he was always smoking with weed. So he's probably high when I went there because every time <laughs> I smoked, I would think I would get contact. I would tell him, could you open windows? Don't smoke weed for at least two hours before I come, please. Because I can't, I'm, I'm coming out of your house smelling like weed. So I did ask him, please don't smoke weed when people are coming down here to look at this property. Can you please do that? And he said, well, people love weed. I said, you love weed. Everybody don't like it. I said, <laughs> and he, he was good. He, he was fine. He's an okay trip. All right. Take a look at, we, let's go to, uh, we did condo. Go, go to uh, 18. Go to look at 18. Hello? Hello. Yes. Hi. Yes. Um, I was waiting for this section uh, because that is what I'm going through right now. I have by a, a seller who uh-huh. is um, going through a divorce, but when he bought a property, he bought a property alone. And he alone name is on a, um, on a title. <laughs> However, um, the, we had an agreement for sale. And a home inspection was done. And um, his ex-wife still live in the house. So he told the ex-wife that they needed to leave along with his children because that's what was agreed upon. But later on, the ex-wife could not find a place to go with she didn't children. Leave. Yeah, so she did not leave. And now his daughter... Um, refused to even go to school because that was the house that she was born in and uh, she's in the 10th grade and you know she doesn't want the house to be sold until uh, she graduated from high school so the father became emotional and cut off the sale now the buyer is threatening to sue for them to execute the um, the agreement uh, he has offered to give them um, for the home inspection and even pay for um, uh, appraisal that was never done and gave them $1,500 to walk away. But now they came back with counter offer of $15,000 to walk away. You mean the wait so for the buyer to walk away? The buyer wants $15,000 to walk away. 
Oh. Oh. Okay. I don't. That's a legal wow. issue. Yeah, that definitely is. Now, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's something. Yeah, I, oof, that's something. Yeah, that seems confusing. Yeah, you need to get your broker or your attorney involved in that one because that's a mess. What that is. Uh, yeah, I wish I could help you there. I can't. That's a that's a that's a little bit more complicated for this seminar. But number eighteen, maintenance and risk of loss. Uh, one of the things that you need to remind sellers is that the property needs to be maintained. Seller will maintain the property in its present condition, normal wear and tear accepted. So whatever the property looks like when that buyer came in, that's what it should look like when the buyer comes back for the pre-settlement walkthrough. And remember, do a pre-settlement walkthrough the day of settlement, not three days before. Uh, a lot of agents, I, I don't understand, they will do the, 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 pro, the settlements Monday at 10. They'll do a pre-settlement walkthrough on Saturday or on Sunday. Well, a lot of things can happen overnight. I've seen people breaking houses, steal all the pipes. I've seen kids out playing and ball goes through that $33,000 bay window. And so it's a good practice to do a pre-settlement walkthrough right from the property, right to the settlement. But going before, I mean, I've seen heaters explode on the night. I came to one property and there was water all in the basement. We did it that morning of, but it happened that morning. So if we did it the day before, we wouldn't have seen that. So it's just a good practice. Do a pre walk walkthrough the morning of and not the day before. That's um, right. I, had a, I had a situation, because I know it says in the contract that we have to, to can do two walkthroughs. Yeah, only two. I had a case where the, where, where the we were denied, as I was representing the buyer, denied the other walkthrough by the listing agent. If you had, but you mean the third walkthrough? The, no, the, the second. Well, that, then they can't do it. You have a contract. You remind the seller what the contract says. That's all. It says, I, we're entitled to two. You, we have one. That's it. And then call your broker or call his or her broker and say the contract says we have two. We, we, have, we have two pre on walkthroughs. We've had one. Get the broker involved because that's silly. That's just a silly thing that an agent will say. You can't come back. The contract clearly says you can have three, two pre-summer walkthroughs. Just if that's the case, call the broker. They'll handle it. I'll go to 20. This agreement will not be recorded. We, and if you record it, then you could be in default. Agreements to sell are generally not recorded. Uh, Simon, here's one of my favorites, because buyer will not transfer or sign this agreement without the written consent of the seller. I've gotten many contracts. Whenever you see a contract that says, John Smith and or his, what well, his assigns, uh, what does it say? Heirs and, and or signs, you know they want to sign. When you get like somebody wants a wholesale or some and, uh, somebody, I don't do assignments. I, I don't. I, I tell my sellers I don't make decisions, but I say, listen, it's, you know, some people read the law, the state law that says that there are two transfer taxes that need to be paid. Some title companies require two transfer taxes. You need to consult a, a tax attorney or an accountant. If you want to assign, I, I need you to contact them because I don't want you to be on the hook. But I don't want them to come back and say you sold it to two different people. Those are two separate transactions. And therefore, you need to pay two transfer debts. I don't believe I'd say to my sellers is better you sign in that you sell into A and let A sell to B. But if you sell it to B, you don't know anything about B. You don't know if B has the money to buy this property. A, we have a proof of funds. We know about A. But now A is going to sign to B. We know nothing about B. So are we going to sell this property? I don't. I think it gets a little complicated. I'm not a fan of uh, assigning uh, property. I'm not. And I tell my sellers that. But again, they make their decision. But and... And I just, so make sure that you understand that if a person wants to sign this contract, it needs to be in writing. Because I've even gone to settlement where we sell it to ABC LLC and then we're sitting at settlement and is BCD Enterprises. I'm like, well, who are you? And they were somebody assigned and they didn't get permission from the seller. Well, there's also somebody who purchases and I've purchased, they're, they're, they're signing the agreement of sale in their name, but they're forming an LLC and they want to settle under the okay. LLC. So you, and they need permission from the seller because there's a different party that I've seen that a lot. Uh, 22, 
the, uh, the, this contract is governed by the laws of PA. So if there are any disputes, they must be filed in Pennsylvania courts and decided under Pennsylvania law. So even if you have a buyer in another state, that's why it says that this, uh, the validity and constructions agreement will be governed in accordance with the laws of Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So you don't want somebody in New York suing in a New York court about something, uh, real estate in PA. So, um, so every, any disputes filed must be filed in Pennsylvania courts. 23, the Foreign Investment and in Real Estate Act of uh, 1980. Anytime a seller is a foreign person, foreign corporation, they are subject to these foreign investment and in real estate, I mean, uh, they have uh, IRS taxes. IRS taxes people who, foreign people, foreign corporations selling real estate in this country. And so if you have a seller who's a, who's a foreign, who's a foreign person, then a foreign person is defined as a foreign corporation or trustee, a trust or something, then you need to make sure those taxes, a title company, you let the title company know because they have to pay taxes or withhold a certain amount of taxes. If not, then the buyer could come back. If you look there, let me look at this. It said that the disposition of a U.S. real estate interest by a foreign person is subject to the Foreign Investment in Real Estate Tax Act of 1980. FERFTA authorized the United States to tax foreign persons on dispositions of U.S. real property interests on the sale of real estate. Further down, it says a transferee or the buyer is a withholding agent. If you are the buyer, you must find out if that seller, that transfer, or is a foreign person as defined by the act. If the seller, the transfer, the transfer, or is a foreign person and you, the buyer, fail to withhold the taxes, then that buyer will be held accountable. So make sure if you if the seller is a foreign person, make sure the title company knows so the taxes can be paid. All right, on 23, foreign uh, notice regarding convicted sex offenders. Should you, if you're the agent, should you be checking, let's say you have a client, who, a buyer who says, I have two young daughters and I don't want them, I don't want to be living around any sex, convicted sex offenders. Can you please check to make sure that there are no sex offenders on no. this block? No. Would you, no. Uh, no. Would you, would you no. do that or not do it? No, no. no. I would be on the website. You would not yeah. do it. And you should never do it because if you make the mistake, then it comes back on you. So absolutely don't go checking for, for sex offenders in the neighborhood for your client. Tell them, give them Megan's list. Tell them they can go to the website uh, is it here? Is that yeah, www.pameganslaw. I'm sorry, www.pameganslaw.state.pa.us, but never check for them. If they ask, you say, here's a website. You can check yourself because if you check and you make a mistake, that mistake comes back on you. All right, uh, we got to get through this. Uh, default, let's get that number 26. All right, I just want one quick question. If the buyer defaults, and I'm clear, I'm dead. I just hear my question. The buyer clearly defaulted. Let me tell you, today is Friday the 24th. Buyer says, you know what, settlement's Monday. I'm not going to buy this house. I just changed my mind. I put $20,000 down. Is there any way in this contract where that buyer can get this 20, 000, his $20,000 back? Buyer clearly defaults. Buyer just said, I changed my mind. Settlement's Monday morning. It's going to be a nice day in Florida. I ain't buying a house in nice the weather. seller agrees in writing. If they seller did, no, no, seller does not agree. Seller does not agree to give it back. Is there any way that buyer can get his money back? Seller does not agree. Seller does not do anything. Can the seller, can the buyer get that 20000 back? Oh, yes. You have a uh, release. They can sign a release. No, no release. I just said the seller has not agreed to anything. Buyer is not no agreed. Okay. Okay. It's in the agreement of sale. All right. Take a look at the answer, by the way, is yes. Take a look at paragraph 26. There's an important paragraph mm -hmm. where buyer terminates this. Uh, yeah, that's not what I want. I want to go. Let's just go to C. Go to paragraph 26C. Mm -hmm. Buyer and seller agree. That if there's a dispute, remember I said this 26C is a prior written agreement. This is that prior written. Remember, there are four items where 
four things that had to exist before a sell, a buy. One of the four had to exist before a broker can give the money back on page under default. B one two three four. First one, if there's no dispute. Two, if there's a dispute but it's been resolved. Three, the uh, dispute but it's been settled by a court. And the fourth, according to the terms of a prior written agreement. Well, C twenty six D C is that prior written agreement, and it reads: Buyer and seller agree that if there is a dispute over the entitlement to deposit monies that is resolved, that is unresolved within blank days, whatever you do, put in no less than 30 days. Put 30 days or 15 days or do not leave 180 days. Please, if you got nothing out of this class or this seminar, please put 30 days or less. All right, I'm gonna read it with 30 days, all right? Buyer and seller agree that there is a dispute over the entitlement deposit money that is unresolved 30 days after settlement uh, or following termination of the agreement, whichever is earlier, then the broker holding the deposit monies will within 30 days of receipt of a buyer's written request distribute the deposit monies to the buyer unless the broker is in receipt of a verifiable written notice that the dispute is a subject of litigation or mediation. Now let's, let's go over there. If that example I use, sell, broker for seller is holding 20,000. The buyer changes his mind on Friday. He says, I don't want the property. I changed my mind. I'm clearly in breach. If that buyer says, let's say you put 15 days there, on the 16th day or here, we leave 30, on the 31st day, the buyer can say, can send a letter to the broker saying, Mr. Broker or Mrs. Broker, send my $20,000 back to me. And the broker must do it unless the seller has initiated a lit litigation or mediation. If the seller has done nothing in those 30 days, the broker must, within 30 days, send that buyer that $20,000 back, period. Now, if the broker, if the seller, after that 30 days, let's say the broker receives a letter saying, give me my $20,000 back, and the seller gets wind of it and says, hey, I'm solid mediation. The broker still has to turn that $20,000 over to that buyer. Now, the seller can still go through with mediation lawsuit, but the $20,000 is now in the hands of that buyer and no longer in the hands of that broker. Did anybody, did y'all know this? Mm -hmm. Is this new to most of you? So yeah. if you have a buyer have who yeah. defaults, yeah. Yeah. oh, a second, if you have a buyer who defaults, mm -hmm. all you have to do is send a letter. I like, I always say send it certified. And it's funny because a lot of people didn't know this and then even my own office, I would get letters and you know what they would say? Thank you, Trent, because I didn't know this before your seminar. So, so please return my client's money. So I thought that was funny. I had that happen too. Thought, they said, Trent, I didn't know that, but thank you for teaching me that. Send me that money back. So of course I have to. So if that, so now let's finish it. Go down, it says that uh, towards the end, it says buyer and seller agree towards the end of that paragraph that the distribution of deposit monies based upon the passage of time does not legally determine entitlement to that money, that deposit money, and that the parties maintain their legal rights to pursue litigation even after the distribution is made. So that buyer can, I mean, that seller can still sue that buyer, but you know, the buyer has the money. You got to get the money now. So you can sue and get a judgment and I don't have any money. Mm. Any questions? I have a question. Well, <clears throat> is is that any any so form of default? Is that any form of default throughout? It does the not year? matter. Does not matter. Is the buyer? It does not matter what happened. If the buyer sends a letter to the broker after that, whatever time. That's why I said put fifteen days. Put twenty days. Let's say you got thirty on the thirty-first day. That buyer can send a letter saying to the broker, "Give me my money back." I'm entitled to my money. And as long as that seller has not filed, initiated mediation or litigation, then that broker within 30 days must send that money back. And even as I said, if the seller then runs down, they call Cheryl and they file a mediation, 
It does not matter. He or she still must give that money back because that seller didn't issue because the seller would not have initiated litig litigation mediation before that 30 day period on him for that 30 day period. So the money still goes back to that buyer. I have a quick question. Yes. So what, what if the broker says that the seller initiated litigation? Are they yeah, required? The proof. It should be proof. Why would you not have proof? If, if you initiate litigation, the, the buyers wanted litigants. So buyer would have been informed of that. You would say, buyer would say, well, when did I, this happen? Send me proof. I didn't get served. Maybe they trying to serve me, but I haven't been served. So yeah, they should be able to get proof. A broker has no reason to lie. Uh, let me ask you this. And sometimes I've been a broker for a long time and I've had people when there are disputes and that happened that often where a buyer will say, well, uh, there's a dispute and I have to explain to them that I cannot, unless one of these four things happen, I can't give you the money. Even though I think you're right. I actually think you're probably right, but I can't determine who's entitled to the money. If that person sues the broker or sues one of the light and one of the salespeople, who would have to pay their learned attorney's fees? Person initiated the litigation. The person who initiated the litigation. So that's the something important you. for you to know because if somebody says that you one of your clients says, well, if I don't get my money, I'm gonna sue your office, I'm gonna sue you, you then you take them to this paragraph, paragraph D, 26D, that it says buyer and seller agree. Uh, that a broker who holds what was that? Right. Buyer and seller agree that a broker who holds or distributes deposit money pursuant to paragraph 26 of Pennsylvania law will not be liable. So if I give that 20000 back, I'm not liable. I'm only doing what this contract says. Buyer and seller agree that if any broker or licensee is named in litigation regarding deposit monies, the attorney's fees and costs of the broker and licensees will be paid by the person naming them in litigation. So if you want to name me in litigation, then you have to pay all my costs associated with me defending this litigation, and you have to pay my attorney's fees. So you remind them that if you want to name me because I cannot control, there are, I have to follow the, the, the uh, laws uh, of this state, the licensing laws and the rules and regulations of the Pennsylvania Real Estate Commission. So I can, as a broker, decide who gets this, who's entitled to this money. I can only do what I'm told to do. And if I do what I'm told to do and you don't like it and you want to include me in a lawsuit, then I, you get to pay for my attorney. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. When does the with re, with regard to returning the funds that paragraph twenty six C, when does that clock start ticking to? Is it the settlement date? And uh, does it whichever is there? Well, if you put thirty days, first. it would be that the whatever date you put in there. It well, was th that's prior to the thirty days. But what when when is day one of that thirty days? Oh, I'm sorry. I see what you're asking. It says after settlement date or following termination, whichever is early. So either the settlement date, whenever settlement date should be, or when it was terminated, whichever comes first. Whatever the whatever comes first. Whenever there was a dispute, that's the, the first time, the first date mm -hmm. right. is when the clock would start counting. Do you still need you still need the release letter, right? No, you don't need a release. Who signed a release? The seller's not yeah. signing a release. Why would seller sign? Seller don't want. Seller wants to keep the twenty thousand. Seller actually is entitled to the twenty thousand. Why would the seller sign a release? Well, I seller thought it was a line. I thought it was a line for either or, so the seller could, you know, be at the twenty or whatever. But no, but you but, you're you're not, but you understand if the seller is not, if you in default, why would I release your twenty thousand? Uh, you, I'm entitled to the twenty thousand. Why would I give it back to you? I, I wouldn't sign the release. Oh uh, no, I was thinking uh, on the release twenty thousand to the seller, zero dollars to the buyer. But but you think a seller signing that? No, I mean you think a, a seller a seller will say I'm entitled to the twenty thousand. I'm not signing the release, so there is not going to be a release. I mean, otherwise you don't have a dispute. If the seller says, "Hey, Mr. Buyer." I'm gonna just give you your twenty thousand back. You sign a release. There's no issue now, right? Because the seller no. agreed to give the buyer the money back. But in no. this case, there's a dispute. The seller's not agreeing to give the money back. There's a dispute. The seller says this twenty thousand belongs to me. Oh no, I'm in agreement with what you're saying. 
I was asking a question. I'm saying I'm a, I'm on the same page you're on. Is it a net? Is this a net? It is. How are you, Mr. Floridian? I'm good, Annette. I'm you're doing a great job over there. You're doing a great job. You know, I don't believe in your money back. So, but <laughs> the the question is, let's just say the buyer agrees to release the twenty thousand to the seller. My only right. question is. The two parties, do they still need to sign a release or not? Yes. The answer to that is yes. If the okay. buyer says, I'm the I defaulted and I'm going to give the 20000 to the seller, yes, you want to release. Because what if the buyer, I mean, you yeah, you want it because you really need the buyer signature because the buyer is saying, I'm willing to turn over my 20000 But the seller is going to be happy to sign because I would say, seller, I'm not giving you 20000 until you sign this document. Seller's going to say, give it to me. I'm signing right now. So you shouldn't have a problem. But yeah, I would say absolutely you have to have a release. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, all right. Let's look at paragraph of mediation. Uh, oh, no. We have to go back up. This, we don't have a lot of time. Look at 26G. Make sure if you ever represent a buyer, please check that box. If you ever represent a buyer. The box that says seller is limited to retaining those sums paid by the buyer, including deposit money, it says liquidated damages. What does that mean? If your buyer is in default, the seller can't come back and sue them for more than what they put down. If they put down a thousand, that's the most the seller can get. If they put down twenty thousand, that's the most they can get. If they put down three thousand, that's the most they can get. And the contract is now void. It is been is over. They cannot come back and say, wait. You only put down a thousand, but I'm out thirteen thousand because you defaulted. Well, that's nice, but if you sign this, it says the seller is only limited to keeping those funds that are paid by the buyer, include deposit money, so it's liquidated damages. And it says the contract is over. And look at that age. It says the seller retains all sums paid by the buyer, including deposit money, so it's liquidated damages. Buyer and seller are released from further liability or obligation, and this agreement is void. I have a question. Why is that there even there to check it? Why isn't just why isn't it just part and parcel of the contract? Because the seller gets to decide. Maybe the seller don't want you to check that. Some sellers are not going to agree to that. Some sellers like if you default, I want to be to sue you for what I'm out. What if I'm out thirty thousand dollars because of your default? I want to sue you for thirty thousand. Peter, I'm yeah. on the limits of whatever you put down. Yeah, but I'm saying, but I'm saying, any anybody who's representing a buyer Thank is you. not going to, you know, it, we, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our buyer is not going to not check that. Well, I'm not going to agree with that because what if the buyer put a hundred thousand dollars? Maybe you don't. Maybe the seller's only out thirty thousand because of your breach. So I don't know if I would agree with that. But if you're putting down ten, two thousand dollars, one thousand dollars, absolutely you should be putting even ten thousand. I would definitely check that. If the buyer is putting hundred thousand dollars, maybe that's that need to be checked because remember the seller is only entitled to what the seller what the seller damages are. If right. the seller can show because you breach the contract, I'm out twenty thousand. They shouldn't be entitled to a hundred thousand. Right, and I get that. But I'm saying if I'm representing this, if I'm representing the buyer. I'm always going to check that box. Anyway, I'm just wondering. I, I, why I, again, I would say I don't necessarily agree that I'm always. I would say you should because, but I gave you an example of your buyer putting down a hundred thousand. Yeah. Maybe yeah. you don't want to check that. I don't know, but yeah, for yeah, the yeah, most yeah, part, yeah. the answer is yes. You you represent the buyer, and you should probably check that. Let me ask you this: Does a is the broker responsible? Does a broker have to put your earnest money deposit in an interest bearing account? No. Oh. Yeah. What was that? I think I think it depends. I think it depends. depends on, no, I'm not, no, 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 it's a, no, it's not depends. Uh, this is a question. No. Does a broker have to put? I'm giving you any more information. Does a broker have to put your your earnest money deposit in an escrow in an interest interest bearing account? No. Oh. The answer is no. No. But if the broker does, where does the interest go? Higher. The interest always follows the principal. So just know that if you put it in an interest bearing. Uh, then the interest belongs to the, pe the person whose money it is. So I just tell people interest follows the principal. So I'm not putting money in an escrow, in an interest-bearing account, because now I got to calculate interest, and then that interest has to go back to that buyer. 
is just easier because you're going to have money in an escrow account for 20 days, 30 days, a month. How much interest are you going to get? But now you've got to calculate the interest and then you have to give that interest to that buyer. So it's that you're not required to put in an interest bearing account. Mediation 27. This agreement says that the buyer and seller submit all disputes or claims that arise from this agreement, include disputes and claims over deposit monies to mediation, which is a which is an alternative to lit, to litigation, and I think is an effective way to resolve matters without having to spend a whole lot of money. 26, a release. On all these paragraphs, it says that the buyer uh, agrees to release the seller. Well, what this says is that the release that uh, the buyer releases, the seller, the broker, uh, everybody basically from any and all claims, losses, demands that may, anything that may happen after settlement, let's say the heater breaks after settlement. So you think that seller needs to give a new heater. You think the agent should have known better, blah, blah, blah. Now you want to come sue everyone. Uh, once you you just you releasing everybody from any claims, losses, demand, uh, should sell it be well, I'm say that. so um real estate recovery fund. Um uh, we all know that real estate recovery fund, this is language that's required to be an agreement set by the real estate license and registration act. We all know the real estate recovery fund is a fund available to people licensed to eight clients who got a civil judgment against one of us, uh, could not collect that civil judgment in court. And within one year, they can bring that final judgment to the real estate recovery fund and collect up to 20,000 per person when per claim from the real estate recovery fund. So if Hello. you should, so if, if Hello. you- Hello? You okay? You all not even hear me? Okay. Oh. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. So, um, all right. So, and uh, communication. I have by, a question. Okay. Yes. I have a question. When is it too late to go after your honest money uh, deposit if that, the sale does not go through when I it is when you when you were denied a mortgage? What well, do you mean? It's not too. When is it too late? You're uh -huh. not doing it right away. Why would you not do it right away? Um, because the buyer travel. Because the buyer did what? The buyer travel and came like three years after. Three years? I yes. don't know the answer to that. You have to ask a broker that. I I don't know why. Even if they travel, don't we went see. for it. We went for it. We we they sent us a. They they wanted a hundred percent earnings money deposit, and my buyer said no, and did not sign the release. That but you all need to go. Then go to, go to mediation or, or call Cheryl at G Park. I don't know Cheryl. Are you on? That, yeah, there is no uh, statute of limitations there. Um, okay. You can you you can phone me and you can try the uh, mediation process. However. Okay. Uh, you cannot force members of the public to mediate. Um, and so if the if the seller does not respond uh, to me, then a letter would go out to the buyer stating that the seller failed to respond. They would hold on to that letter and file in court to okay. see if they would have any luck there. But there is no uh, statute of limitations. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Um, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, 30, I know we over, I didn't know it was after 12. Uh, communications with buyer and our seller. If buyer is, if buyer is getting a mortgage, buyer will promptly deliver the broker for the buyer, any uh, copy of the loan estimate and close the disclosure. You all understand that the buyer, the, the loan estimate, remember the, the loan estimate is given to a buyer within three business days of making a loan application. The close and disclosure is given to the uh, buyer th within three business days of closing. Those documents have to be given to the buyer. They can't be given to the agent. So you need to tell your client when you get the loan estimate or the close disclosure to give you a copy because they're not, they 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 come to the buyer, not to the agent. Uh headings, this stuff, the headings are just there for convenience and organizational purposes, uh, special clauses. Uh, go down to buyer and sell acknowledge receipt of a copy's agreement at the time of sell signing. Make sure. 
It is a violation of the Real Estate License and Registration Act if you if you do not give a buyer a or any client a copy of anything they sign. You anytime you sign anything, you have someone sign anything at the time that they sign, you must give them a copy. A lot of agents don't do this. If you're meeting somebody at Starbucks, take two copies because if they sign something, they have to get a copy of it. Don't mail it to them later. Don't email it to them. Don't stay have to get it at the time that they sign it. All right. Uh, this agreement should be executed. Uh, okay, go to um, uh, go to go down to the uh, uh, the buyer. The, they'll tell the uh, lines that the buyer has received the consumer notice. You obviously you have to give a consumer notice. So and a buyer buyer has received the clo estimated closing cost sheet. You're required to do this. Now, if the if the lender provides a close the estimated closing closing sheet. As long as it has all your expenses, all the fees, let if you if your office, for instance, is charging a broker service fee, ask them if they would add that in. If you've got all the fees in there, you don't have to prepare one. You can actually use the one that the lender gives you, but you want to make sure it's accurate. So if you charge, I would have them put on the home inspection. I would put anything in there so it's all the fees that uh, that buyer owes. Uh, buyer has received the deposit money notice. That is, if it's a if it's a co-op, if it's an in-house transaction, clearly you don't need a deposit money notice because we know who's holding the money. If if Compass represents the buyer and the seller, then Compass will be represent will be holding the deposit money because they represent both parties. But if you have two separate companies cooperating with one another, then the company that's holding the money has to be the one who's collecting the check has to notify the buyer that his or her money is being turned over to this other company. Uh, and the buyer has received the lead-based paying addendum. Um, now make sure that's a part of this contract. Sometimes I think agents forget no. that. The lead-based paying hazard disclosure is a part. You have to attach that to your agreement of sale. So make sure you get the lead-based paying hazard disclosure, which just the seller has to disclose if he or she has any, knows of any pain hazards or any uh, lead base or other pain hazards. You have to disclose that. That has to be a clue, uh, included or uh, attached to this because the buyer has to sign it. You, the agent, must sign it. Uh, so make sure you attach that. And, now, and so the last thing I will say is that if they seller, I ask this one question. If the seller, let's say the seller signs a contract today, your seller signs March 24th, you don't send the contract over yet. You haven't signed it. Let's, no, let's say the 20th. Let's say they signed it the 22nd. Your seller signed this offer the 22nd, but you did not give it to the buyer's agent. They still haven't gotten it. Today's the 24th. Buyer calls you up and says, hey, agent. I want to withdraw my offer. Could that buyer do that? Yes. Seller signed yes. it the 22nd, yes. but the seller agent never gave it to you. Could right. that yes. buyer withdraw the offer before they get to sign the signed copy? Yes. yes. The answer is yes. And what's the point there? As soon as a seller signs an agreement sale, the first thing you should do is email it to the agent for the buyer. You shouldn't wait hours. You should definitely not wait days. If you get in your email, the very first thing you should do, don't even get up or wherever you are, immediately transfer it. And now the buyer has not been notified because if the buyer has not been notified until that buyer actually knows and has received the copy by, through, by his, through, through his agent, then the buyer can withdraw the contract. I've seen that happen where agents, and I just think that's just the sloppiest thing I've ever seen. I, there was a case where a agent, the seller signed it a week earlier. The agent never bothered to get, he told the agent for the buyer that the seller signed it. And the agent for the buyer kept saying, where is it? Where is it? We need to, and he says, I'll get it to you. And then this buyer got angry and said, I don't want it. I'm going to get another property and withdrew it. And the seller says, you can't do that. Man, I said, yeah, and end up suing the his agent because the agent never turned over the contract. Don't ever let that happen. All right, that's all I have. Any questions? I know we're over our time. I don't even know what time it is. I'll watch it. What time? Happy oh, birthday, it? Trent. 
Thank you. Well, my birthday is Sunday. If you all want to send money, I send my cash app or Venmo information. <laughs> I don't accept money. So I'll be 40, so give me 40, well, 45, 50. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, uh, I don't remember. When you get older, you don't remember <laughs> birthday. I don't even want to think of this year in birthday Stop coming up. Thanks Thanks for the I just want to say you always do a great job, man. This is like the fifth or sixth time that I've been on your well live and your calls, but um, me too, Vince. Me too. <laughs> well, thank you, Vince. I that I appreciate that. I do. I, 